cold in here. Oh, it feels good, though. Yeah, it does. It'll feel good. Since last meeting, you went to White Knoll Middle. Did you go anywhere else? White Knoll Middle, was that it? I was trying to think of what we wanted to update on. White Knoll. That's orange. And then the beach group tour, I'm going to talk about that in the context of the regulations. Something else you're going to bring up? Uh, you also mentioned doing that with Columbia thing at the other school district last week. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is a oh, yeah, I did. Day, did yeah, I was on Gilbert Primary. Tim and I were. Mm -hmm. okay. I thought about that. Okay, it is now, it's November 19th, 2019. It's just a few minutes after, a one minute after 7 o'clock. We'd like to welcome all of you during this time of Thanksgiving, and we are so glad you're here as we head into the holidays. And it's hard to believe that it's almost Thanksgiving, and then I think we're a week short, so we're going to have a real fast Christmas, and then it'll be the New Year, so, and then it'll be 2020. Can you believe that? Anyway, do I hear a motion to adjourn executive session and begin open session? So moved. Thank you, Dr. Powers. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Green. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries it and, is, and it is unanimous. I would like to inform you that the district is in compliance with the South Carolina Freedom of, of Information Act by notifying the media of the date, time, and place of this meeting. And we would also like to notify you that the district does tape this meeting for accuracy in preparing the minutes. And at this time, I'd like to call on Mr. Oswald, who has our invocation tonight. Mr. Oswald. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we approach this Thanksgiving, we pray that you instill in us a grateful heart, a thankful heart, a loving heart, one that is ever mindful of your countless blessings that you continue to bestow upon us. Open our eyes, Lord, that we may see and recognize all for which we are richly blessed. We also pray for your guidance. We ask that you provide this school board with strength and wisdom, not only to use our minds, but most of all, to include our hearts in all that we do. Help us be reminded to always keep children first and foremost and at the focus of all of our endeavors. And also, Lord, we ask that you continue to teach us to have a grateful heart of compassion, one that is filled with love, kindness, and forgiveness. We ask these things in your name, name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Oswald. That was, that was lovely. 
Do I hear a motion to approve the agenda as presented? So moved. Thank you, Dr. Powers. Do I have a second? second. Thank you, Ms. Green. Are there any questions or comments regarding the agenda board? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor of the agenda as presented, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries and it is unanimous. At this time, uh, board members, you have been provided copies of the minutes for the October 1st, 2019 special board meeting and the October 15th, 2019 regular board meeting. Other than the corrections that have already been provided and made, are there any additions or corrections to the minutes of either of these meetings? Hearing none, we'll accept the minutes as received. Uh, board, uh, it, we're now to report and action items from executive session. Do I hear a motion to approve four certified recommendations for the 2019-2020 school year? Madam Chair, I move that the board accept the four certified uh, employment recommendations for the 2019-2020 academic year um, by Dr. Little and the administrative team. Thank you, Dr. Powers. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Oswald. Are there any questions or comments, board? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries and it is unanimous. At this time, we're gonna move to honors and achievements and I'm gonna ask Dr. Little to step down. The Lexington County School District 1 Board of Trustees provides a time for citizens, oh, excuse me, I'm scooting on. Hold on, I'm wrong script. Let me get back on this one. We celebrate successes of many kinds during the honors and achievements portion of our board meeting. We recognize our students' first place state awards first, second, or third place national level awards, achievements of our students and staff, as well as international competition winners and other big awards. We also recognize our staff's awards, recognitions, and grants, and celebrate the contributions of and partnerships with our business partners and community organizations. We feature all of tonight's honorees in your proof positive. Let's see if I have a copy right here. I think I do. Um, it's this newsletter which was on the sign-in table with the agenda as you came in. If you did not pick one up when you signed in tonight, please do so on your way out. It makes a great keepsake, and it's also a special thing to share with your grandmothers. Let's see. Grandmothers love those things. Audience, you should know that if you try to follow along in the newsletter tonight, you might need to skip back and forth from page to page as we will not recognize our honorees in the same order as they appear in Proof Positive. We also ask that you please stay until we finish recognizing all of tonight's award recipients as each award winner deserves our undivided attention. However, to accommodate our youngest honorees and their families, once we finish, we will give you a chance to leave before we resume the meeting. So you're not locked in that seat until 10 o'clock. <laughs> honorees, when you hear your award and name, come on up and stand with Dr. Little, who's right here at the front waiting for you. We're gonna start with horses, and I actually learned some new terms and some new words, so this is a fun one here. We begin tonight by proving that our students don't horse around. They are serious competitors. White Knoll High ninth grader Eliza G. Allison attended the 53rd All-American Quarter Horse Congress in Ohio this year, along with teams from the Quarter Horse Association, 4-H, and Future Farmers of America. Eliza took first place in Hippology overall team, Hippology stations individual, Hippology exam team, and Hippology team stations. She also won a horse bowl overall team award. So let's give Alice, Eliza a round of applause. Wow, look at all of her awards. Now, Lexington District 1 student members of the Country Springs 4-H Horse Club in Pillion showed out in the 2019 4-H State Horse Show at Clemson. Riders from across the state put their riding and showmanship skills through rigorous display in the hopes of qualifying to compete at the 4-H Southern Regionals later in the year. Gilbert Middle School's sixth grader, Victoria E. Leiter, scored impressive first place wins in cross rails, Junior Hunter Showmanship, and Hunter Under Saddle. Pillion Middle School sixth grader, Brooke Stallnaker, capped her riding performance with a first place win in both short stirrup two feet and short stirrup two feet equitation. I hope I said all that right. So let's give these ladies a round of applause. Oh, 
that's exciting. Now we're going to move to the Scholastic Press Association All-State Award. Lexington High School's E. e. Brook Beatty, Beatty, Trinity C. Bullock, Meredith Cook, Caroline Sheely, Kelsey Turner, and advisor Candace Cannon join us tonight to represent the staff of the Cat's Paw Yearbook. The entire list of this year's staff is listed in Proof Positive. This year's sponsor and yearbook advisor, Candace Cannon, is also here tonight. The South Carolina Scholastic Press Association recognized the Cat's Paw as their Fall 2019 annual conference by presenting them with an All-State Award and the Palmetto Award for Class 4 yearbooks. Meredith Cook also received an award in the Best Extended Caption category. We got, a, we got more awards, so hold on, wait just a second. The conference drew more than 600 attendees and some tough competition. So let's give these ladies a round of applause. Yeah, it does. Okay, now we're going to go to the State Fair. Lexington District 1 students taking first place at the South Carolina State Fair include Carolina Springs middle 7th grader Allison Lindler, Gilbert middle 6th grader Victoria Leiter, Midway Elementary 3rd grader Madeline Brown, Peelian middle 6th grader Brooke Stallnaker, and River Bluff High 12th grader Joseph Ivory. Allison Lindler excelled in the 12 and under category with a first place for youth, horse, hunt, seat, equitation, and hunter under saddle, as well as grand champion hunter showmanship. Victoria Leiter also competed in the 12 and under category and took first place in hunter over fences, 18 inches, and Brooke Stallnaker grabbed first place in 12 and under Western showmanship. Moving to the arts, Madeline Brown took a first place award for 3D art, and Joseph Ivory became a finalist in overall photography and placed first in his category. So let's give them all a round of applause. Wow, that's beautiful. Okay, we're now going to talk about our Palmetto Gold and Silver Awards program. Established by the Education Accountability Act of 1998, South Carolina's annual Palmetto Gold and Silver Awards program recognizes and rewards schools that attain high academic achievement or for making substantial progress in closing the achievement gap. We, we are excited that we had seven Lexington District 1 schools recognized with a Palmetto Silver Award for their performance last year, the 2018-2019 school year. If the principals of the following Palmetto Silver Award winning schools would come forward, Lake Murray Elementary, Meadow Glen Elementary, Meadow Glen Middle, Midway Elementary, New Providence Elementary, River Bluff High, and Rocky Creek Elementary. So let's give these ladies a round. Oh, and gentlemen, sorry. We have to brag on Miss Stanley. She just got from, back from Washington, D.C., accepting her Blue Ribbon Award for Lake Murray Elementary. So proud of them. Okay, the South Carolina Department of Education also recognized the previous school year award winners. If the principal of, principals of these schools would also come forward. Meadow Glen Elementary and Rocky Creek Elementary each received a Palmetto Gold Award for their performance last year, the 2017-2018 school year. While Gilbert Elementary, Gilbert High, Lake Murray Elementary, Midway Elementary, New Providence Elementary, River Bluff High, and White Knoll Elementary Schools all received Palmetto Silver Award recognition for the last year, the 2017-2018 school year. Are any of the people from Gilbert, 
Lake Murray, y'all want to come on up? So let me call those out again. Gilbert Elementary, Gilbert High, Lake Murray Elementary, Midway Elementary, New Providence Elementary, River Bluff High, and White Knoll Elementary. That's a bunch of you. Come on up. Yeah. While they're taking their picture, let's give them a round of applause. Yeah, way to go. We're going to continue with staff awards. Competing against theater teachers across the United States and Canada, Carolina Springs Middle School drama teacher Jennifer Simmons won the Pioneer Drama A-plus teacher playwriting contest with her play, Game of Myths. Her play uses Greek mythology, part of the content and standards in sixth grade. Sixth, seventh, and eighth grade theater students performed this last year. She received $500 as an advance for the rights and royalties. After publishing this spring, other educators may incorporate her play into their class activities. Carolina Springs Middle will also receive a one-time $500 gift in her honor. How nice is that? Let's give her a round of applause. And I think she's getting to be a regular here at our meeting. So just, oh, gra oh, congratulations. The South Carolina Athletic Coaches Association uses a thorough selection process to choose only a few coaches for their Hall of Fame. The process reviews accomplishments and candidates that uh, blah, blah, blah. the process reviews accomplishments and candidates that must have an outstanding record of integrity, character, behavior leadership, and professional, community, and civic contributions. This year, they have honored Coach Mark Biedenbaugh can now boast that he has joined that elite group of South Carolina coaches inducted into the Hall of Fame. And let's congratulate Mark. This is quite an honor. I just want to say, when you go out to Pelion, how many kids do you have running track? I mean, in, you have a boatload of kids out there. Yeah. And he gets them up and after school, and they are just going to town. And it's because of this man. And he has contributed so much. Thank you. South Carolina school district teams competed for in the 2019 CHOPT competition at the annual School Nutrition Association of South Carolina's conference. Lexington District 1 food service managers became champions oh, after a 45-minute long battle requiring them to creatively incorporate three mystery ingredients. Their ingredients were mozzarella cheese, taco meat, and Doritos. To create a tasty meal that met the judges' criteria and scored highly in food safety, sanitation, teamwork, and presentation. The Lexington District 1 team included Carolina Springs Middle's Angela Angie Furtick, Gilbert High's Renee Ritter, and White Knoll High's Kelly Blevins. Let's congratulate them. So what, was the, what did y'all name your creation? Ooh, Mexican pizza. That sounds yummy. Oh, sounds delicious. Congratulations. We'd like to ask Red Bank Elementary Principal Jan Reichert, please come forward. 
a grant from the Children's Trust of South Carolina Strengthening Families Program brought $75,000 to Red Bank Elementary. Let me repeat that number, $75,000. The money helps them work closely with families to reduce problem behaviors and conflict and to improve communication skills, all while strengthening family relationships and teaching children the necessary skills for success in school and life. The program focuses on families with children 6 to 11 years old and provides preschool childcare and activities for children 12 to 16. Thank you, Ms. Riker. That's wonderful. And thank you to Red Bank. The school-wide book club at White Knoll Middle benefited from a Dollar General Literacy Foundation Youth Literacy Grant this past summer. Lead interventionist and instructional coach Candace Lett used the $2,000, let's repeat that number, $2,000 in grant funding for the purchase of Junior Book Awards books. Only 14 schools in South Carolina received this grant and White Knoll Middle was one of them. And these are intended to help grade level students or struggling readers. So is Ms. Lett here? No, but let's give her a round of applause. The online giving platform DonorsChoose.org gives educators an opportunity to post funding requests for extra classroom needs such as technology. Meadow Glen Elementary School first grade teacher Denny Titcomb made sure that first grade students will benefit more from flexible seating and fidget tools. Midway Elementary School fourth grade teacher Tammy Sharp purchased materials kits, a tabletop easel, and chart paper and a series of books for her classroom to support students becoming readers for life. Red Bank Elementary School teacher of the deaf, hard of hearing, Christina Burbage, sought funds to honor Helen McGow, a former Red Bank Elementary teacher with communicating what we see and do, hands-on activity and visual materials for the deaf, hard of hearing students at Red Bank Elementary and throughout the district to encourage language, storytelling, and conversations. White Knoll Middle School drama teacher Deborah Adams, special education teacher Lisa Hartman, chorus teacher Jordan Henry, sixth grade social, uh, sixth grade social studies teacher Suzanne Keller, special education teacher Chandler Ma Mappas, sixth grade social studies teacher John Paul Sellers, special education teacher Bonnie Slice, and orchestra teacher Jolene Walter received a range of funding to support equipment and technology, books to supplement instruction, classroom supplies, and athletic gear to enhance physical exercise and better health. Let's give these teachers a round of applause. Are any of them here? Right there, you wanna come forward and have your picture? Y'all come on up and have your picture made with Dr. Little. Yeah, come on up. Gotta get your picture made. <laughs> Thank y'all for doing all that. Okay. Gatorade and the National Athletic Trainers Association named River Bluff High School co-head co athletic trainer Dr. George Wham as the District 3 Gatorade Secondary School Athletic Trainer of the Year. As you remember, this is Mr. Wham's first year at River Bluff. These honors come from his time at Pillion High School and recognize his innovative athletic health and safety work promoting health and safety among student athletes. River Bluff High's new co-head athletic trainer, Mr. Wham, recently won honors during his tenure at Pillion High. As part of this award, he received a Gatorade Play It Forward grant as part of Gatorade's initiative to encourage and empower athletes to realize their potential through sports. So let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, Dr. Wham. And I apologize, he is Dr. Wham, and I kept calling him Mr. Wham. So Dr. Wham, congratulations. Carolina Springs Middle School first year eighth grade teacher Kristen Laughlin wrote a grant application and received a $500 grant and a 500 Scholastic Book Club's bonus points to help her build her classroom library. Selected as one of 4,500 recipients from among more than 125,000 applicants, Laughlin intends to use the grant provided by author James Patterson and Scholastic Book Clubs 
to expand her students' book choices to keep them engaged and interested in reading. Way to go. Support for educators' ideas and initiatives provided by Mid-Carolina Electric Cooperative's Bright Ideas Grant Program provides educators up to $1,000. This year's winners include Gilbert Elementary's Michelle Fuller, Pelion Middles, Ashley Owens, here they come, Saxagotha Elementary's Eunice Broach, Kimberly Lewis and Donna Vestal, and White Knoll Elementary's Beth bon Banco, Banco, Banco. Banco. Their grants provided funding for a cross-curricular art and science lesson for 255th grade students, coal frame greenhouse raised beds that students will build in their school and community garden, and additional Lego materials to help second grade students expand coding projects. Let's give them a round of applause. And I'd also like to thank Mid-Carolina Electric Cooperative because without these local businesses, these things wouldn't be possible. So we appreciate our local businesses. <laughs> Carolina Springs Middle's World Language Teacher and Junior Beta Club sponsor, Mary Ann Deal Jenkins, applied for and received a non-monetary grant from Palmetto Pride. This tree grant donated 75 red maple trees that their junior beta club planted on campus near the outdoor fields. Lexington District 1 maintenance staff helped by marking power, water, and gas lines near and at the site, digging holes, and making sure the 35 students involved were prepared to plant the trees properly. Students Nathan DeBerry, Skylar Espenson, Zaria Gibson, and Gregory Pinckney led the project. Are any of, any of those people here tonight? Let's give them a round of applause. That's a really neat one. I like that. We need all the trees we can get on our school They're campuses. probably sore in the bed after planting 75 yeah. trees. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of trees. The South Carolina, South Carolina Commission on Higher Education and the ACT awarded several mini grants to schools participating in College Application Month and College Goal South Carolina events such as College Application Day, FAFSA workshops, and College Decision Day. Pillion High's Director of School Counseling, Jessica Burke, qualified for a mini grant to help her expand student awareness and statewide college access. That's great, thank you for doing that. <laughs> Carolina Springs Middle continues to seek funding support for its Special Olympics project successfully. Special Education teacher Erin Schumper, recent, recent grant from the Unified Champion School Program, guarantees that the program continues to flourish and provide rich opportunities that lead to the creation of socially inclusive schools that support and engage all learners. Is Ms. Schumpert here? Well, let's give her a round of applause. The Walmart Foundation Community Grant Program supported White Knoll Middle's athletics program with two separate grants of $1,000 each. Principal Guy Smith and athletic director and football coach Joseph Albino will use the money to enhance the athletic program at White Knoll Middle. Principal, Principal Smith's grant provides awards such as trophies and plaques for the end of the year Honor Hawk Awards program and replenishing the awards for first, second, and third nine weeks programs through the principal's office. The athletic meals grant sub submitted by Albino provides light pregame meals and hydration for the football, volleyball, basketball, and cheer team. That's a great, that's a great grant. Thank you for doing that. And that is, we are going to conclude. We want to thank you for taking the time to help us recognize the many honors and achievements of our students and staff and the many generous contributions of our local businesses and community. We love sharing our good news with you. Honorees, when you leave the meeting, head to your left and into the lobby where a member of the communication office will help you find your certificate. Now, just as I promised, you are welcome to stay or you are welcome to go home and start cooking for Thanksgiving. So thank all of you and have a happy Thanksgiving. No, just the parents need to start cooking. The kids have got to go to school.
You have to come at the end and get it. You have to come at the very bitter end. We only sign at the end. Sorry. <laughs> it's a long one, too. You picked a long one. We'll go ahead and resume. We're now to item 9.0, which is citizens participation, and I did not receive any cards. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on. Let's keep going. We'll go to 10.0, which are action items. And at this time, we're going to have second reading of policy TBD, Municipal Securities Continuing Disclosure. That just sounds so exciting. And Mr. Salters is presenting that. Let's get a motion on the floor and then we'll open it up for discussion. Do I hear a motion to approve policy TBD, Municipal Securities Continuing Disclosure, whose codification is to be determined for second reading? And I think what they're saying, are you saying that they may recodify it so CBD is not correct? T TBD is just to be determined. Um, oh, the, the, I thought yeah. it was one of those cute little No, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. The, uh, See, he's the, trying to outsmart me, and he did. That's the problem, he did. The, uh, the School Board Association has not uh, given us codification well, for this policy you. yet, but we, uh, we will have that. Um, okay, well, you got me good on that one. So, do I hear a motion to approve policy whose codification is to be determined for second reading. 
So, Madam Chair, I move that the board accept the administration's recommendation to approve the municipal securities continuing disclosure policy as presented. Okay, thank you. We have a motion from Mr. Oswald. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, thank you. From second from Dr. Powers. So now let's open it up. Mr. Salters, you want to walk us through this to be determined policy? Yes, Madam Chair, members of the board, thank you. Um, just uh, to remind you, this is a, a policy that was drafted by um, in, in conjunction with our bond council and um, it's recommended for us to have this policy um, as a board policy. When we go to sell uh, bonds, it um, gets us uh, in compliance with the SEC Rule 15C2-12, um, and that references a continuing disclosure requirement um, that we are recommended to follow, which basically um, deals with any material um, event that occurs a, as part of our, our, our business. And um, I can, I, I left you a, a piece of paper at your chair, this um, continuing disclosure kind of, it's kind of in a nutshell. And it, it highlights what types of events are, are um, recommended to be disclosed. Um, you know, in, in the list, um, if, if we had some significant, um, you know, lease or some other activity that we entered into that could change our ability to make a bond payment, that would be uh, required to be disclosed. So um, I did not receive any changes from first reading to second reading. So um, yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions, uh, but we would uh, recommend approval this evening. In our recent bond sale, we did actually have one of the um, underwriters uh, request a copy of the policy. Um, and so underwriters are starting to ask for this as part of their review of, um, of packages for, for bonds. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Salters. Are there any questions or comments before we vote, board? I presume this obviously helps us uh, achieve a good rate on the bonds as well. I mean, this in place. It, it does give offer a, some security. Yeah, that's great. It does give a comfort level to those right. uh, looking at the bonds. That's, that's, that is correct. Um, does this apply just to capital funds or does would events in our operational budget? Like, I was just thinking if for some reason um, some sort of uh, state or federal funding ended, would that it doesn't apply to those sorts of situations? Uh, it, it's, it's, it could, I, I guess it could. Um, it's primarily related to, you know, any additional debt that you might incur. Um, like, a, I guess the best example would be some kind of, of lease. Like if we went out and did a big computer lease or something like that um, and, and changed our position or, or our commitment uh, ability of, to, um, to pay our investors, that would be um, primarily what it was for. So you could have an, uh, you know, a lease on the general fund side, I guess, that could, could impact that. Do we know when the codification will be completed so it can be uploaded? Uh, I do not. Um, I'll, I'll pass that on to you as soon as okay. I get that information. Do we have a, a method for doing that, Mary Beth, where if it's not codified, we have a place to put it, to pend it until it is so codified? So we're going to actually have that more than once in okay. the next upcoming months. Uh -huh. um, so we're the first district that has asked for this, mm -hmm. but the School Board Association is in full support, and they'll actually assign a codification to it, and then anybody else who asks for it will use ours as the model policy okay great I just if, if we had constituents that wanted to look this up right. they could find it um, it'll go up pretty quickly once we send it to them after it's approved okay and um, you'll see that we're in the next few months we're going to be bringing some other policies that have no codification yet okay. great I'm always a worst case kind of guy if we fail to do a continuing disclosure is there like a room at the bottom of the SEC I have to go spend a night in, or what does that look like? Is there a penalty for, for failure to provide um, continual disclosure? I, I don't believe there's a room that um, they're, they're going to put us in, um, but, it, but it certainly um, could impact our future bond sales. Okay. And, and obviously we, we've been successful uh, recently, and we have a, um, you know, a, a good number of bonds left to sell, and we want to be in the best position. Uh, to do that, so so um, this is factored into our bond rating. Um, it, well, it is is part of of the underwriting process. They they do look at this. Uh, as I mentioned, one we had one underwriter in the previous sale right. yeah, ask right. for that. So um, it is part of that process. Yes, sir. okay. Thank you. Right. Any other questions or comments, board? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries, and it is unanimous. Um, we are now going to 10.2, which is a waiver for online administration of South Carolina College and Career Ready Assessments, which is called South Carolina Ready. 
Um, uh, Dr. Phillips is presenting this. He's the Assessment and Accountability Director. Um, do I hear a motion to approve the waiver for online administration of South Carolina Ready as requested? Madam Chair, I move that the board accept the administration's recommendation to approve the waiver for online administration of SC Ready. Okay, thank you, Ms. Green. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, thank you, Dr. Powers. We now have a motion and a second on the floor. Let's turn it over to Dr. Phillips and find out a little more before we vote. Dr. Phillips? Okay, Madam Chair, members of the board, um, the State Department of Education offers districts the opportunity to request a waiver from the State Board of Education for the requirement that we do all um, state testing online um, during the last 20 days of school. Um, over the past few years, we have applied for this waiver and received it uh, for certain grades. Um, the application process has changed this year and it requires the approval of the board. So what we're asking today is um, that you grant us permission to apply for that waiver again for grade three for SC Ready testing um, in May. Okay, thank you, Dr. Phillips. Are there any questions or comments, board? We, yes, sir. Do I'm, we have a copy of that waiver that we know what we're giving permission? I can to give you a copy of it right here. Can you explain to the board why third grade is the uh, the grade level, Dr. Phillips? Uh, yes, sir. So the reason we're asking for third grade is this is the very first time these students are taking the SC Ready test. And it's also the grade level at which um, if they do not score a particular level on that test, they're retained or flagged for retention. And so... Um, we want to make sure these students uh, take that test in, a, in the most familiar and welcoming uh, format that they can. And so at the recommendation of the overwhelming recommendation of our principals, we're requesting that grade three be the grade in which we do this. Okay, great. Any other questions or comments, board? Okay, hearing none, thank you, Dr. Phillips. We appreciate that. We have a motion on the floor. Do I? Um, all those in favor of the motion as presented, uh, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Well, I haven't had time to read this yet. Okay. Um, do you just want to uh, abstain? Do you want to abstain? No. I mean, I would think everyone would want to read it to see exactly what it says before they vote to approve something. I mean, I could be wrong. In that case, I'll just vote no. Whatever you want to do. If everyone else wants to vote yes. That's fine. I mean, you can ask for a vote. I'm just going to vote no. Okay. Or we can table the matter until we've had a chance to read it. That's left up to you. Okay, well, let's just take a minute or two, board, and let's look over this. I think the motion passed, didn't it? Yeah, I think we had enough unanimous. I think it passed. So, okay, because we did, we did take a vote. Let's just go ahead with that. Um, all those opposed? I'm opposed. Okay, so we have six in favor and one opposed. The motion carries. We'll now move to 10.3. That would be five opposed. Five in favor. Yeah, five in favor. Oh, that's right. Yeah, thank you. Forgot. Thank you. Thank you. I forgot Mike's ill tonight. Yeah, I'm not Mike. No, you're not Mike. That's for sure. <laughs> I bet it's quiet down on that end, isn't it? <laughs> okay, we'll now go to 10.3, which is student travel requests. And uh, do I hear a motion to approve 12 student travel requests as presented by Dr. Talley? Madam Chair, I move the board accept the 12 student travel requests as uh, presented by Dr. Talley. Okay, thank you, Dr. Powers. Do I have a second? A second. Thank you, Mr. Oswald. Are there any questions or comments or anything you want to add, Dr. Talley, before we take a vote? Okay, Anne-Marie? Um, no one ever takes me up on this offer, but I'd be happy to chaperone the trip to the Netherlands, Germany, France, Italy, Austria, Switzerland, and England in July, so. I, I think you have Just, to know all those languages. Are you good um, on that? They all speak English. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a motion and a second on the floor. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries, and it is unanimous. Thank you. 
And at this time, we are going, Dr. Little is going to take the floor. He's got a good bit tonight. We're going to turn it over to 11.0, which is our superintendent's report, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Little. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you can see we have quite the, uh, quite the agenda tonight with the uh, comprehensive financial report as well as uh, s some other really big reports. I know uh, Mr. Poole's here to talk about a, uh, the college center at Gilbert High School that we'll be walking through as well. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Salters in just a moment. But before I do that, I, I would like just to take a moment to congratulate uh, Leah Sarantopoulos and Julie Painter. Uh, Leah Sarantopoulos was named the South Carolina Assistant Principal, uh, sorry, the South Carolina Association of SCASA's Middle Level Assistant Principal of the Year. And then Julie Painter was the uh, SCASA High School Assistant Principal of the Year. So once again, lots of great leadership. <clears throat> they are also both graduates of our Aspiring Principals Academy. So we're, uh, we're very excited about that and uh, just thrilled that our, our leaders continue to show out at the state level and, and do really great work. Um, so with that being said, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Salters and uh, we'll start on our comprehensive annual financial report. Thank you, Dr. Little. Um, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Matthew Hodges, our uh, audit manager. I uh, really appreciate Matthew being here this evening. Um, and I'm going to uh, get the podium, or Matthew, I guess you can grab that podium. Um, we have a, a presentation for you tonight that um, highlights the um, annual financial report. Um, and. Uh, you know, as as Matthew's getting ready for uh, the presentation, I, w I would like to just take a moment um, and give give thanks to the, uh, the finance team that's uh, here this evening, um, and really all of our principals uh, and and staff that are here. Um, this this audit um, highlights the quality and attention that that is given to financial management in Lexington School District 1 and really appreciate um, everyone's efforts to get to this point. Um, I know the finance staff has spent um, hours upon hours um, getting getting this uh, CAFR ready and so if they seem a little weary-eyed this evening that's uh, that's why I put them uh, asked them to sit up front so they uh, would stay awake so uh, um, but really appreciate all the hard work and effort that they've they've put in with us and and thanks to uh, Matthew and Burkett Burkett and Burkett um, been a great great team to work with to get this uh, before you this evening so Matthew I turn it over to you well thank you all very much I appreciate your time this evening and the opportunity to present the results of our audit um, provide a brief introduction, address our required audit communications, uh, present just a brief summary of the financial statements, and answer any questions that you might have. So our team is uh, Larry Montague is our audit partner in our West Columbia office who reviewed and approved issuance of our reports, and I serve as audit manager for the firm. Uh, again, we wanted to express our appreciation uh, to the finance team, everyone who worked so hard in putting together uh, this document, and uh, all the employees of the finance office in the district for uh, the cooperation that we received in our audit. Um, please report we had no disagreements with management whatsoever in performing our audit. Um, one item, the, the top item there says there's no significant change in accounting uh, policies during fiscal year 2019. Um, and just one item I wanted to, uh, to mention about that is that next year uh, there will be a change in accounting policies that I'll be presenting. Uh, to you in regards to fiduciary activities. Uh, that's your pupil activity funds. Uh, there's been a change in accounting principle that will be in effect for fiscal year 2020. And those will be uh, presented in a separate uh, section. Actually, uh, this is probably the first time, I, and maybe the only time I ever get to say this, but the CAFR document may actually be getting smaller uh, next year because the uh, pupil activity funds will be as part of special revenue funds, which provide condensed information. Um, so just a heads up on that, that'll be for next year. Uh, we didn't have any consultations with any other independent accountants in performing our audit. Uh, there were no issues discussed prior to our retention as your independent auditors. Uh, and again, we received no difficulties and received full cooperation from your staff. So in performing our audit, we tested transactions based upon our knowledge of the district. We used professional judgment selecting samples, uh, which were designed for reasonable but not absolute Assurance says we didn't test 100% of transactions, uh, but we did not note any instances of noncompliance with uh, district policies. 
All reports issued three clean opinions. Uh, first, on your financial statements. Secondly, on internal controls, there were no deficiencies noted. And lastly, uh, a clean opinion on compliance with regards to your federal awards. Uh, as we look at the district's financial health, uh, you remain in excellent condition. Uh, your AA bond rating with Standard & Poor's and the A1 rating uh, with Moody's was reaffirmed with your bond issue during fiscal 2019. Uh, you continue to have an assignment of fund balance based on your fiscal year 2020 uh, budget appropriations, which shows looking forward and good financial health. And uh, as far as your certificates of excellence and financial reporting, this is the 25th consecutive year that you've received uh, this award from ASBO and the 24th consecutive year of receiving this award from GFOA, which is a very high honor. Um, they conduct a rigorous review of the CAFR document and uh, so management is certainly to be commended for receiving these awards. So ASVO is the Association of School Business Officials, and GFOA is a Government Finance Officers Association. Uh, as you well know, Lexington One is a growing uh, district uh, with an increase of 488 students um, during fiscal year uh, 2019. Um, one item that's not on my slide is that your student-teacher ratio did uh, remain flat at about 14.5 students. So that's just one item. Even though there's growth, you're hiring teachers and able to keep that flat. Uh, the property growth, uh, value growth, increased 3.9% as well during the year. Yes? I think that's a decent jump. It is. Right. It was on pace with last year. It was, about, it was a little bit above 3% last year as well. So the general fund balance increased $5.6 million. Uh, that's the net number in, in fiscal year 2019. Of that, your revenues increased about $9 million. Uh, so that uh, includes $1.3 million in local property tax revenues, $1.7 million from state EFA revenue increase, uh, $2.8 million in state fringe. And I don't have it on my slide, but there was another $2.8 million in state uh, revenues in lieu of taxes. The general fund expenditures increased $12.2 million. Uh, in that, there was a net increase uh, in employees of 89. Uh, salary increases to employees as well as increases in the employer required contributions uh, for employee insurance and retirement premiums. Uh, that retirement premium rate increased by 1% again uh, for fiscal year 2019. And the difference uh, is in the, the transfers into the general fund. So the general fund balance was $57.5 million at June 30th. Of that, prepaid items uh, represent $1.3 million. Uh, I mentioned the fund balance being assigned. There was $8.3 million that was assigned as part of the 2020 budget. And the unassigned balance was $48 million. Uh, that represents 18.4% uh, of your general fund expenditures. Your district policy requires that at least 7% of the general fund balance, uh, general fund budget, uh, be held in fund balance, and that amount was 19.6 million. So you had 48 million that went towards that. Your total government uh, fund balances were $183.8 million. And then how is that, that general, if we go back a slide, that general fund balance at 18% of the total General fund has that been constant year over year? Has it been holding? It's an eight? increase uh, this year. Last year it's about sixteen point six. Okay, it seems uh, higher. Than, yeah. Yes. Okay. And, and what is the um, recommended GFAO um, level? They like for it to be at about that sixteen point six to seventeen around there. Uh, so you're just a little bit above, but not not out of the range. Okay. But that's an appropriate level. Absolutely, definitely. Okay. All right. I know this is a little bit hard to see, but this is just a summarized uh, version of the statement of uh, net position for the government-wide financial statements. Uh, on the assets, you can see the current and other assets increased $64 million. Uh, that is largely due to um, the increase in the capital projects fund balance, uh, which was because of the, uh, the ban, the $85 million ban that was issued in April. Uh, that also increased your long-term liabilities by about $57 million. The capital assets themselves uh, increased due to uh, purchases from that band during the year. One quick question. Yes. 
go back. Yep. Capital assets, that's net of depreciation? It is. It's okay. net of depreciation. Okay. I'll go ahead and talk about that. So that's, uh, that is an actuarial calculation. It's not a liability of the district. Same thing with the OPEB. It's the uh, district's uh, allocated portion based on evaluation done at the state level. Um, that portion, the district's portion, is based on fiscal year 2018 contributions, required contributions to the pension. Uh, these were added, the pension was added about five years ago. OPEB was added to the books last year. It was the first year that was presented. Um, so those, again, you're not going to have to write a check for $600 million, uh, but that is your actuarially determined liability um, as reported by Gatsby. Yeah, that that's correct. That's, that's, uh, the actuarial evaluation is done a year before uh, so that the audit on the pension and OPEP can be done, and then we come in a year later and use those numbers. And then our, our long-term liabilities, I assume, are... Um, bonds? Correct. Okay. It also includes uh, compensated absences, uh, employee leave. Gotcha. But yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. And uh, as we look at the overall uh, revenues and expenses for the district, um, the operating grants are up $4.3 million, uh, and property taxes up $3 million. State revenues, I mentioned earlier, up 3.5. Um, so overall, an increase of just under $12 million for total revenues. Total expenses are up just under $24 million. And that, again, is uh, about half of that is due to the general fund, uh, the expenses I mentioned earlier, as well as the uh, district share of the OPEB uh, and pension expenses. Okay. All right. Right, it was about half. It was about half. It was 15, some, some were plus, some were minus, but that represents about 15 million. Yeah. Okay. I'll be happy to answer any other questions you may have. All right, thank you very much. Um, it is my privilege and pleasure to introduce tonight uh, Ryan Poole. Um, he has presented to you before, but before he talks to you, I, I just want to give you a little background. I, I don't want to step on your presentation. Uh, this has been a, I don't want to call it a labor of love, but it's, it's really the, the only way I can describe it at the moment. We've been, we've been working on this project really since I would say the summer of 2016, uh, Dr. Talley, I believe. And uh, we have talked about this, and we've talked about it, and we've talked about it, and we've been partnering, and we've been trying to, dis we've been trying to work with, find a, the right partner to make this a reality. And over the last six months, we've made a lot of progress on this. And uh, I believe tonight we are, we are making a recommendation for this thing to happen. So. Um, Without further ado, I, I, there's some really cool stuff we're getting ready to look at. And uh, Mr. Poole, talk to us a little bit about what we have going on at the College Center. The, talk, tell us more about the College Center at Gilbert High School. Yes, sir. Dr. Little, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, thank you uh, again for allowing me to speak to you tonight. Um, at, from previous presentations, you know I, I speak fast, so um, please stop me and ask any questions that you have. As Dr. Little said, um, this is a, an exciting venture, and, and since Dr. Little came on board, um, around the same time that, that I did, we've been talking about uh, college opportunities for our kids and, and not just in terms of, of like tuition savings, but really college mindedness. And um, the, the idea that um, not everybody will go to a two year or four year college, but we're not gonna make that choice for you. We're gonna do everything we can to prepare each student to make that choice for his or herself about what their path is. And this is, uh, we believe opening one of those paths. So it directly relates to our strategic plan, performance goal two. Um, the district will implement strategies to improve equity and high level coursework um, with a strategic action step that looks for sort of non-traditional structures to get kids into higher level 
uh, courses. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. What I'll be specifically presenting is a, is a developed idea with your charge and, and blessing to move forward. We'll turn that into a plan that we can act on pretty quickly. So um, this is a well-developed idea. I will try not to go sort of too into the weeds. I know from project planning that what it will look like in August probably will be much better and different than what it looks like now in my head and, and on the screen. So, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions as we go. So when we think about how we design a school experience um, that sort of breaks the mold and disrupts uh, the traditions that, that sort of advance some kids to college, and others not to. We look at how we create a college and career and community experience that is going to, to respond to students who traditionally haven't um, gone on to a four-year school. Uh, we, we designed um, a, a proposal, a plan of, of this college center experience, and it really meets our four system commitments to propel students with the skills they need to be ready to, for the next level. And that means all kids can be ready for that next level to your four-year college, um, regardless of circumstances. We're going to be teaching different kind of skills that directly relate to what it means to be a college-bound student and a college student who, who makes it through that freshman year. Um, we've got partners with USC uh, Aiken who, who research with us and, and talk about what are the factors that um, cause students not to make it through their freshman year. And it's often not the academic preparation, it's these other pieces that, these uh, connections to our power skills. Um, so we look at um, how our students benefit from partnerships like with USC Sumter or Midlands Tech or industry. And, um, and commitment three is about making sure that our system is, is partnering with families and, and communities um, to make the students' experience better and that our students are giving back to their communities. So a big part of this college center is also this community aspect, both the internal community of the college center and what they, they do in relation to their, their partners and, and the, the community around them. Um, also, equipping students with the skills and resources they need for students who haven't traditionally been on this path is um, not something that we can just hand a, a bunch of students over to, to some teachers and administrators and say, now make them college bound. So we've got to do things differently, and that means equipping the adults differently. And we're going to talk about that through some different partnerships. And I'm going to breathe for a second. Whew. So I go, you know, I go fast, and it's late, and it's past my bedtime already. Um, so the, the College Center at Gilbert High School. Um, so Gilbert is, uh, has a space um, at the high school that is a, a beautiful, very college-feeling space. Um, we also see uh, students, and part of the culture at Gilbert High is really talking about um, possibility, and, um, and and this was a really fertile ground for this this opportunity. Um, so we started talking with USC Sumter about what this would look like, and part of the, I'd say, opportunity has been that we aren't a, a geographic zone that has a college in our in our zones. So we had to think a little bit differently, but that's turned into really um, a, a good way to, to think about opportunities in a different way. So um, the College Center is, uh, so think of the centers that we have um, at our other high schools. Um, this one is a little bit more generalized. Um, we look to open with a class of freshmen, hopefully in the fall of, of this coming year. Um, right now we have about a pool of about 780 students that we fall into um, eligible, and then we can weed that down to, to a group that looks more like our target uh, group that's looking more like 130, that from those, given the choices that they would need to make to, to commit to this center, um, getting 25 to 30 we think is, is really feasible. Um, I failed to introduce Shanita Chapman is here with me. She's one of our career specialists with the district. Um, she has a background with higher education, and she's been helping me kind of think through these ideas. Um, look at the target population. She'll be helping develop recruitment material, and she's been sort of in, invaluable as we think through this. So um, I wanted to introduce her to you guys. Um, so the, the College Center will give students a high school diploma, but it will also give them um, really rich college experiences that um, overlap dual enrollment, AP, career exploration, internships, um, to give a sense of this belonging and to change a trajectory of a kid who might not otherwise find that place 
um, without certain kind of supports. So um, you're going to see a, a short video at the, the end of this with one of our partners that's really sort of captures far better who we're after um, more than I can. So hang on, and, and I think you'll enjoy that. Um, one of the special pieces about the, the center is a partnership with AVID, which is a national group. I, I hope you guys uh, have seen a, an article that came out with USA Today that shows how AVID students um, progress through college at like 45% um, versus um, their, their counterparts at, at around 11% success rate. But I can get that to you if you haven't seen it. Um, so AVID uh, will be a big part of what we do. Absolutely. If I may, also, if you'll recall, uh, Mr. Uh, Smith, Guy Smith from White Knoll Middle School, uh, they talked about AVID on his presentation tonight. And Carolina Springs Middle School is also uh, using AVID as a strategy to um, uh, capture this same group of students in middle school. Right. So Carolina Springs has our first cohort. We, we hope to have our second at White Knoll Middle then this next year. And those kids uh, might be perfect applicants for this program as well. And so it really looks at, towards the to kids in the academic middle, maybe first generation college students um, who uh, maybe just don't right now believe that they're college bound kids. And, and, and we do believe that they're college bound kids, or at least we believe they deserve to have that choice. All right, now this is really into the weeds. So I'm gonna do some pointers. Like I said, in August, this may not look what, um, what it will look like right now. But it's a pretty good idea. So we don't want to exclude any students who haven't been um, in English 1 or Algebra 1 in the eighth grade, because that decision sometimes can get made very early on, but it doesn't necessarily reflect a student's aptitude. Um, so in the summer of this year, we can provide an English 1 class to get a, a group of students ready. If you see here, so this would be the freshman year the sophomore year, the junior year, and the senior year. So going out into spring 24. Uh, so that freshman year, we're going to go ahead and embed an AVID class across the whole year paired with an English 2 honors class. That will be specifically uh, chosen with certain teachers who, who really demonstrate this mindset that Yes, you can do this. Yes, you will do this. We believe in you. And we're going to give you the skills. And it's not going to be easy for you, the kids. It's not going to be easy for the parents. It's not going to be easy for us, the teachers. But we're going to achieve this, this goal. Um, so that goes across the first two years, this English 2 honors, English 3 honors. You'll see we have a literacy component with English all through all four years. There's not much choice in this schedule, although there are some elective options and world language options. Um, so students, this is not for everybody. Um, just like our kids in Accelerate or um, with some of our other centers, you have to make some choices. And we think there are a group of kids out there that this, this is for them. Um, and it will provide the social and emotional support and the rigor. You see they start. And these are kids that are not necessarily identified right now as the the um, future valedictorian of their classes, and we're going right into AP classes here in the freshman year with supports and honors classes to go with it. Um, in the sophomore year, we continue, and you get into two more AP classes where those students are developing this college-mindedness with a cohort family feel and the, the social and emotional support that comes with it. The junior year is where you really hit it heavy. So by then, we believe our students will have qualified with PSAT or SAT or ACT scores to take dual enrollment classes. They come in tuition free because of lottery tuition assistance. And they're almost exclusively in college at this point, but in that safe space in the Gilbert Center with their AVID teacher every afternoon to talk about what's working, what's not working, study strategies, tutorials with each other. Um, from there, the senior year opens up a little bit. You still have that AVID support, but that shifts more to FAFSA and college visits and consolidated versus unconsolidated debt and what all that means, because you might not have a parent at home who's been through college or an older sister or brother who's done that. So we're going to be giving that support, going out to colleges, and, and that belonging and belief is a real part of, of their, their experience. By this point, we hope that they're saying, 
yeah, we get it. We're college bound. We're going, you know, get off my back. But, but we're not going to get off their back. You're still going to take hard courses. You're still going to get those credits. And you're going to get out and start applying while you still have the safety of, of school with you. Okay. Question. Mr. Poole, so I think I heard you. you. So in the sophomore year, they will be taking the standardized tests, which qualify them for the state tuition program? Well, it Is qualifies that... them for admission into USC Sumter. Okay. Correct. Okay. Um, but um, our, some of our students start taking that in eighth grade, ninth grade. So we're going to be ensured that, that we've got them. And our dual enrollment has grown so significantly over the past few years with our partnership with USC Sumter. Um, that has not been a barrier for our kids. So we'll have some good ideas of if we need to be worried, you know, starting in that freshman year. But I guess what I'm saying is, so that's acceptance to USC Sumter, but then I think I heard also funding for the classes in the junior year is gonna be so, driven. Right, when you take yeah. two pairing dual enrollment classes, uh -huh. so if you have two in a row, you can go ahead and qualify for tuition assistance. Okay. Um, so uh, the, the lottery tuition assistance, and those, those classes are paid for. So that would flow Oh, okay. So instead right. of the student having to pay for it? Correct. No okay. tuition. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, so the, the whole thing, they can come out with 24 hours at least of dual enrollment credits and then tack on another 15 to 18 hours of college credit through AP, all tuition free. So they're going to come out um, really with some good savings. I always say more than that savings because I changed my major five times. It wouldn't have saved me much money because I kept changing my major. But I believed I was college bound. I would believed I belonged there. I had been in enough college classes to say, yeah, I can do this. And if they believe it, that's sort of worth, you know, all the, all the effort. Um, because that's the piece where our partnership with USC Aiken comes in and says, if they don't believe it, they're not going to stay, right? So um, this is a, a draft. Um, there's some flexibility in there. Um, but again, this is a, a very select group of, of kids that that we believe this is gonna get them not only through high school when they maybe haven't found a place otherwise, um, but it's gonna get them into college with the skills to find their place when they get there. And the same 30 kids are gonna be in these classes together. I mean, they, they will truly be together these four years. So, yeah. Um, or is it two flight? I mean, yeah, two. it'll be a little bit of a blend. So sometimes okay. they'll be going out into Gilbert to go to world language classes. Maybe some wanna take French, some wanna take Spanish, some wanna take German. So they go out, and some of the classes they would go out, especially for the higher rigor classes, because there isn't a choice and there is a cohort of 25 kids, we're gonna do those together. So it kind of looks on the schedule like a singleton, and, and you build the, the schedule uh, around that a little bit to make sure they can have those guaranteed experiences together. And then there are some classes where they'll go out. Mm -hmm. And I would also say the 24 dual enrollment hours, um, is truly um, really a minimum. Uh, we've been talking to USC Sumter about some other options that that second semester senior year. Um, there are some opportunities that we, we would talk about the, the Council of Higher Education. Uh, we think 24 is really a, a, the low end of the number that it will ultimately be. So we're excited about really where it can land is, is even more than the 24 and the 18 to 21 but we just wanted to make sure we could deliver what we were promising. And when we're advertising this, we're gonna, we're gonna deliver what we can promise, but we are confident that they'll have more than 24 dual enrollment hours before they leave um, high and that, school. And that will replace the AP classes. So. Not necessarily. Oh, it, so it, it may be AP in addition to. Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, and I, presuming this is like one of the, the other centers where the students travel from wherever their home school is. Um, Gilbert's an EL school, so will the EL um, environment cover this as well? Because um, that has a little bit of a different, you know, a little bit of um, crew and things like that. Yes, ma'am. So, so Gilbert right now has crew at the beginning of the day, so our students could get there to be a part of a crew either together or, or out with other students in Gilbert. That's uh, going to be determined a lot in the planning with Mr. Nelson, who's somewhere here. Um, and uh, and uh, expeditionary learning is, is a big part of the, the learning culture at Gilbert. So these same teachers who are Gilbert teachers um, that will be teaching these classes are going to be bringing in uh, things like uh, uh, protocols that are used uh, regularly so that students learn to expect certain academic and instructional consistencies as part of their process. They're going to be learning that 
their learning is not just sort of academic preparation, but a part of a, their contribution to a better world. That's who Gilbert is, that's who EL is, that's who AVID is. So it all kind of blends together nicely. AVID provides structures like academic skills and mindset structures that allow students to be better EL students or better IB students or better. So it's sort of a, a platform that you use to be the best of whatever it is that you want to be as a school. So it's going to be application-based. Um, that application, we have lots of examples from neighboring districts, from early colleges, which this is not an early college. This has a, a, a more unique flair where we get to do a lot more choices um, for ourselves uh, in partnership with a higher ed. Um, but it's application-based, rising ninth graders. Uh, the next year, we would have another cohort, so we'd have ninth and tenth graders and, and so on moving up. Uh, to see this grow into you know 250 kids across the, the campus in four years. Um, first generation college students in the academic middle, um, thriving in a small learning environment, really creative, independent, curious, risk takers, um, folks who, who might say this whole traditional idea um, of high school, it's never sort of seemed right to me. I'm looking for something different and this might be it. Um, however, it's going to be demanding coursework. So, uh, someone who's serious about their academics and serious about developing the relationships that are going to help them push through. So we, we think there are 30 out there at least um, in, in our schools in, in eighth grade right now. And I'd like to add one other thing. And the, I love the focus on the students that are potentially first-generation college students. Um, we're in the college search process right now with my daughter, who's a senior. And um, with the change in... Um, college funding and need-based tuition. Um, there's a band of the best colleges and universities in the country that pretty much automatically give first-generation college students a full ride, including spending money um, and the money for extracurriculars and the money to do study abroad. And so the more we can do to enable these kids to get to that step, there's opportunities there that Aren't, aren't available to other students. Um, and I think this is a really great way to push them to that, um, to that door that's gonna open for them. Right, and make them believe that, that they should, should charge through that door. So um, uh, the AVID video, you, you're really gonna love it. It's about two minutes long and it, it really kind of captures that idea. So what's unique is the, the small cohort experience. It's not just about accumulating credits, it about, it's about college-mindedness. And that's gonna be a, co a conversation we're constantly having. Um, you know, are these college-minded decisions that you're, you're making, uh, you know, how far are you from that, that true belief that you are the, the next college student? Um, incorporating the feel of both college and high, and high school, so you get some of those traditional experiences and some of the safety net of, of high school while also pushing into the college rigor um, and, and putting yourself out there. So high levels of individualized support, the AVID elective makes it unique. And then an early college, for example, is, is about that accumulation of credits, maybe towards the generalized associates. We like the idea that you're getting a lot of different kind of experiences um, with the college center. And, and we think that puts kids in a, in a better positioned uh, place to, to kind of come at things from, from several different angles and say, yeah, I'm an AP student. I'm a dual enrollment student. I'm a high school student. Um, I'm a cohort member. I'm a friend. I'm a student. I'm a, a teacher, you know. So we think this looks at some, some possible startup commitments from a college center. Um, we want uh, a real point of contact, someone who has the expertise to go recruit and work with counselors at all of our middle schools to find the students. We want someone who knows how to put schedules together and collaborate. We want someone who does the hard work of of collaborating with teachers with, with students who haven't necessarily been in high rigor courses before and, and start to question themselves and, and how to support that. Um, but when you add it all up, it's really about a position and a half or so or just some tweaks to the schedule. So uh, the startup costs are, are pretty affordable. AVID membership is uh, up to 15 for the first year, but that gives you a bunch of library resources and training that are not required in years following that. So um, at, with a district partnership, that becomes more affordable with the more schools that, that join in. So these power skills are, are on our left. It's a part of who our students are. 
Um, I'm going to disengage during the video because it kind of gets me every time. It's about two minutes, but it really does capture who our kids are, and I think Josh is going to start it for us. People like me. People like me. People like me. People like me don't go to college. Nobody's ever going to convince me that I'm going to be somebody someday. Street cred, it's more valuable to me than my education. My life will be defined by those who doubt me. I know there are some out there looking up to me. I'll let those AP and honors students be future leaders and policy makers. Because me, I'm just one out of a long line of statistics. Who knows, maybe I'll even study. But it won't affect how my life is going to turn out. People tell me I can't succeed because they can't see past my skin color or how I talk. They say I don't care enough to be a first generation college student. I am the last person in my family that's going to be successful. I'm aware of the skills and talents I possess. This is my destiny. That was me before Alvin helped me see my potential, believe in myself, and turn all of that around. And now, this is my destiny. I am aware of the skills and talents I possess to be successful. I am the last person in my family that's ever going to be a first generation college student. I don't care enough, they say, because they can't see past my skin color, how I talk. People tell me I can't succeed, but it won't affect how my life is going to turn out. Who knows? Maybe I'll even study statistics. Because me, I'm just one out of a long line of future leaders and policy makers. I'll let those AP and honor students be looking up to me. I know there are some out there, those who doubt me. My life will be defined by my education. It's more valuable to me than street cred. I'm going to be somebody someday. Nobody's ever going to convince me that people like me don't go to college. So I, th I think that kind of gets at, at why. Um, we're, we're working towards this. It, it gets at who our students are and, and who our partners are and what they're about. Um, we've got um, Jacob Nelson, uh, who is the right principal for this uh, at the right school at the right time. And I'm happy to field any questions. Um, and uh, with, with your charge, we will start really planning and getting this off the ground and start talking and finding our kids. Do you have any questions for Mr. Poole? I have a question. You said that y'all were looking for someone to go out and recruit students. What kind of criteria will they have to meet to be accepted? <coughs> so right now, we're definitely not looking for um, just those students who have been um, GT gifted, identified when they're in the third grade. Um, to start out, and we're going to kind of really see what this means, I've been looking at um, students who are um, meeting grade level for several years in a row, so they're performing at a reading and writing and math level at least on grade level. That doesn't necessarily mean they've been bumped up, up above grade level. If you're reading and writing at grade level, then you should be able to progress through our system through 12 years into, into college. Um, so that gets us at about 700 um, kids or so in the eighth grade right now across all the systems. Um, from there, I would say that um, other schools that and school systems that we've seen, um, they look for things like uh, sort of um, uh, factors. Um, we do this for um, full day pre-K, so you look at factors like uh, maybe pupils in poverty or you look at a first generation college. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of dis different districts that have Establish some criteria. I think we can take the best of all of those to find who our target kid is. It's also a lot to ask a kid to say there. There are some sacrifices, not not a lot, but that choice. So I want to find 30 kids that want it. Um, I'm hoping I have 70 that want it, and I have to you know figure out how to to weed it out. Um, but if if a student's kind of already on this path, then then maybe there are some students that need this more than than somebody else. Um, so. I don't know if that answers your question, but the academic middle is is at grade level because they're going to be dumped into some pretty rigorous stuff. 
um, right off uh, the, the bat um, with the social, emotional, and the academic supports there. Um, but, but at least functioning at grade level, we think they will be able to get the ACT and SAT scores to get into the dual enrollment by the junior year. Okay. It, will there be an application process? There will be. Right now we have five or six different models that, that partners use. And um, with, with y'all's blessing, we'll start kind of coming up with, with ours. Um, I, I know that some of the criteria that we use for the, the full day pre-K kind of works for us. And we end up, I don't, I don't live in elementary world or pre-K world, but um, you know, we, we group kids about kind of where they're meeting criteria and then there's some random selection within those categories. But there will be an application process and you know, we'll, we'll kind of see, I, I, I hope we have more interest than we can sustain and then we can grow it from there. Okay, um, you also had bus driver on there as a position, what would that be for? Well, um, I don't want transportation to be a barrier for anyone who wants to go to the center at Gilbert, and it is a full day experience. Um, I put that on there um, not knowing the details of what Mr. Kurtz can work out in terms of creatively moving people. We move people to our centers now, um, so it's there as a, we need to think about this, um, but I know Mr. Kurtz is really creative um, about how he does that. I don't know if it would require a bus driver, um, but I didn't want to not include it as something that might need to be considered. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments, board? Well, I think it's exciting. So thank you, Mr. Poole, and thank you, Mr. Nelson. We're excited. And Dr. Talley, I know this has been her dream for a long time, too. So we appreciate that, and we look forward to hearing more. Um, Dr. Little? It's an exciting time. Um, that's going to be really neat. Thank you, Mr. Poole. Thank you very much for uh, all the work to make this happen. And uh, we've, we've got a pretty truncated timeline at this point, but we're going we're gonna to make it happen. All right. Um, I believe, Mr. Caldwell, um, you're up next on our list, sir. Yes, sir. I don't really have a great segue, <laughs> but we will... Uh, uh, at the beginning of the school year, we we had an uh, I guess maybe an overabundance of uh, bed bug introductions in some of our schools, and that led to a request that we uh, do some research. and And uh, I need to start off this presentation with an apology um, to Amy Wood, our director of nursing and health service uh, nursing and health services. Uh, not only is she a part of the presentation, and I left her off the agenda, she has been instrumental in the in this research and really does the day to day work. So I do apologize for not giving you that credit. Um, for, for that, so thank you for that. Uh, I want to start off by just saying, according to the EPA, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, a school is not an ideal place for bed bugs, but it is an ideal hub uh, as they travel because they tend to, as we say, hitch rides, hitch uh, rides on students from their homes uh, to the schools. It's not really an ideal place for them to flourish because there's not a, a steady um, blood host, if you will, to, to feed. Uh, but we, we do recognize the fact that there are bed bug introductions, not only, uh, and it's not, it's not relegated to one particular geographic area. We've had, um, as of last uh, Thursday, I think we've had 10 introductions uh, at, at 10 different sites, I should say, maybe more than 10 introductions, but there's been at least 10 schools affected all across the district in, in just about every geographic region. So it's not just one particular area or one particular school. Um, but uh, again, at the beginning of, the, of this school year, there were multiple bed bugs introductions, particularly at, uh, at uh, one or two schools. And so that request was made for the procedures, uh, a, a review of our current procedures, and that's what we've done. And that's what I want to report on tonight. Uh, <clears throat> we began by looking at uh, information from 10 other, uh, from 10 total school districts, Lexington one being one of those and then nine others, and then other several respected bed, bed bug authorities. I didn't make that term up, that's what they call themselves. Uh, we, we talked to, or didn't talk to, but we researched uh, several uh, universities, University of Minnesota, the, the state of Michigan, Virginia Tech, um, the uh, New York City, New York City Department of Ed New York State Department of Education has its own pest management unit in the Department of Education. 
So there's, there's lots of protocols and procedures that New York City has in place. There's even a Central Ohio Bed Bug Task Force. Who knew? Um, so this is, this is certainly not a, a situation that's Lexington One or a South Carolina problem. Uh, it, is, it is nationwide, and we, in looking at all those research, uh, all those other authorities, what we wanted to find out is what are they doing that we're not doing? What are we doing that's, that's good, and, and what can we do to improve our, uh, our procedures uh, to make this an even better uh, tool to use against the, uh, for the bed bugs? Uh, the strengths of our procedures, well, we have procedures. And that sounds like a flippant comment to make, but I say that because as we researched uh, local districts, several of them have no procedures at all. And when we talked to them, they said, you know, we kind of do, do this case by case, but with you calling and asking us about this, maybe we need to get some procedures in place. I'll also say that when we, when we looked at many of the procedures that other districts do have in place, they look very familiar because they've borrowed ours that we've had in place since 2013 uh, and call them their own. Um, another uh, a strength of our, uh, of our procedures is we have uh, four social workers uh, that work tirelessly with this effort. Uh, so we, we collaborate with them a lot and they do a lot of the, the behind the scenes work going to the, to the homes. Uh, if need be, offering uh, resources that families may not have that, uh, that will help them if they have an infestation or have an issue in their home. Um, and the third bullet, and I'm going to turn it over to Amy, and as I alluded to earlier, not only is she instrumental in this presentation, but her school nurse, nurses really take the lead on this issues when there are introductions uh, in the school. So I'm going to have her speak to that at this point. Thank you very much. Um, so school nurses, oh, come on. She asked if she had to stand up. I've I said did. No. I specifically asked if I could. Can I stand over here because I kind of move around a lot? Okay, thanks. Um, so school nurses um, are really the, they provide the structure for the procedures. Um, and they do that primarily um, by knowing the procedures, knowing where they're located, and being able to communicate what needs to happen. Um, before we do anything with our procedures, the thing that's really the linchpin is a positive identification. Because we, believe it or not, have had times where people thought a bed bug was found on someone and we had it analyzed and it was carpet fibers. And so we don't want to start this process unless we know absolutely for certain that it is a bed bug. So knowing that the specimen is going to come to the nurse to make sure that there's a positive identification, that's where the nurse really gets started. Um, the nurses have access to an EPA training. They access all the times and they are encouraged to kind of go back and review that from time to time that helps them with identification. If they are un uncomfortable or if they don't feel like they have a good enough specimen, then we have other options for them. They can contact me and I can kind of take a second look at it, or I can either pick up the specimen and take it to the Clemson Extension so that they can identify it, or we can send pictures of it to the state entomologist at DHEC. And we've done both of those on numerous occasions. Um, actually, Clemson Extension is where we found that we had carpet fibers and, and not a bed bug. Um, so we, we base everything on a positive specimen identification. So let's just say that um, in Ms. Smith's third grade class, um, a, a positive specimen is, is identified on um, a, a student's book bag. If I am the nurse at that school, I will arrange to have the student brought down to the health room discreetly with their belongings. I will assess the student's clothing and the belongings, so book bags, coats, everything like that, to see if there's any further evidence of bed bugs on, on the student or his or her belongings. Um, at that point, we will call the parent and let the parent know what we have found, because even though we know that finding a bed bug on someone is suggestive of a bed bug um, issue in their home, it is not proof. And so we want to call the parent and let the parent know what we have found, and then as the nurse, I will do a very simple but very effective screening. And I will ask three main questions. 
are you able to have a licensed professional pest management company come and evaluate your home? Do you have a dryer in your home available to you to use? And do you have either plastic resealable bags or some kind of plastic bins that you can put your family's belongings into during this process? Those three key questions help the nurse determine what steps need to be taken. If a family says that they cannot have a, um, you know, they're not in a position to have a pest control company come out, then we refer them to our social workers and the social workers help with that. If they say that they can do that, but maybe they don't have a dryer in their home, we actually will um, allow them to send clothing to us every day we will put the clothes that they came in on in the dryer on high for 30 minutes to heat treat their belongings, put them in a different um, pair of clothing, and we will keep that extra pair so that every day we can have them wearing their clothes. We can just heat treat as they come in. We will take the new pair of clothing off, put the old one on that we've already heat treated, and, and send them back to class. How many days or months do you do that, Ms. Woods? Typically not very long because we do maintain contact with the families throughout the treatment process. Um, and so when we know that, that they've gotten to a point where treatment was successful, then we, we discontinue that. But we have had some students that we've had to do that for extended periods of time. And it's just the situation that it is. And, and, and we do that so that we can minimize introductions in the future. Um, so then we also will offer if they are unable to um, to do any of that we will actually even offer to let them use our dryer at school if they would like to bring in maybe a week's worth of clothes at a time for their child dry them on high heat treat them at school and then we will arrange if they don't have bins or plastic bags we will arrange for them to get those so that they can keep the heat treated clothing in those bags and just pull from it every day to send the student to school. So those three very simple questions really tell us a lot about what we're gonna need to do to help this family. Um, and then after that, once we've made a positive identification and we know the, the student and it's on their belongings, we then communicate with the teacher and we let the teacher know that we're gonna provide, we as in the school, we're gonna provide um, resealable plastic bags for every student in that class because we want them all to put their belongings in the resealable plastic bag when they get to school. We want them to only take out what they need when they need it, reseal it, and at the end of the day, take all of their belongings out, reseal it again so that the nurse um, can, or someone, you know, maybe the health room assistant can go through and inspect the bags to make sure that there's nothing in there and then the kids go home at the end of the day. And then we also, once we initiate the bagging process, we send letters home to parents to let them know that we are bagging their students' belongings and why, and to give them a little bit of information on um, bed bugs. And so throughout all of that, the nurse maintains contact with the family to try and make sure that if they've, you know, if they said, yes, we can have somebody come out and, and we'll arrange to do that, we follow up with them and say, hey, just wanted to check in and, and see, you know, what the, what the verdict was. Sometimes they tell us, yeah, they, they checked everything and we, they couldn't find anything. Okay. That happens sometimes. Ms. Woods, how long do you bag the, um, the belongings? How do you do that for a couple weeks, a month? That also depends on how how the the feedback from the the family goes um we've we've done it for some we've done it it's been a very quick thing in two weeks and we're done um, for others because it was such an ongoing thing it may have been a month um, but like i said throughout all of this the nurse is maintaining that contact with the family um, to see if they need additional resources, if there's anything else that we can do, and if there are future introductions, then we kind of take it a step further and start making a plan with the family um, to definitely have them send in some clothes so that we can make sure they're being heat treated um, every morning and the student can change into them and go back to class. Thank you. I think it's... it's uh worth pointing out that, uh, that the communication that we have with the parents as a part of our procedures 
uh, is something that other districts and, and other agencies don't recommend. Uh, in fact, the CDC and the EPA recommend that you only notify the parents when there's an infestation in the school or in, or in the classroom. We take that a step further to every, every time we possibly can notify the parents, we do that. Certainly we talk to the parents of the student who brought the introduction, if that can be determined. But we go a step further and let, uh, let the entire class know whenever possible. Uh, so the recommendations we have for our existing procedures is uh, we currently have a coordinator of custodial services, um, and I've talked to Mr. Salters and gotten his blessing on this. Uh, he also is our pest control liaison for the district. Uh, so we want to provide, there's actual bed bug training that uh, talks about introductions and treatments and infestations and those type things. So I would, uh, we're recommending that he receive this training and then he be the consult for the district. Uh, each time there's an introduction in the school, then he can be um, contacted by the school and given the specifics of the, of the uh, introduction and decide uh, if, a, if he needs to inspect, if we need to do a treatment or those kind of things. So we'll have a, a bed bug expert, if you will. Um, on site and uh, that can do a a face-to-face -face, uh, inspection or can recommend particular treatments or other things that need to be done. Uh, we do send home educational materials uh, with parents when we send those letters home but there's some other information from EPA and and the CDC and, and other places that we want to send home that's just that further supports the, the parents and their treatment if they have issues at home. And as I said earlier, we involve our social workers with this, but we want to involve them earlier in the process. We, we, have, we typically involve them at the end of that screening if we realize that the, the parents don't have resources to treat. But we want to include them at the beginning of this because they may, they may be aware of, of a family situation. They may be aware of, of where uh, students are doubling up and uh, they may have been displaced and, and families living with other families so that, um, so that we realize that we're not dealing with just an isolated incident with an isolated student. It may really impact several uh, sets of students. So we want to get those, those folks uh, um, involved at the very beginning. Other things that we thought about, we had a, a tremendous amount of conversation about school buses and, and what to do about uh, the possibility of bed bugs on school buses. Um, as we research this, our, our data doesn't indicate that a school bus is a good source of transmission of bed bugs. And I say that because if, if we had uh, an elementary student that had an introduction and we believed it be because of a, uh, of a school bus, then logic would tell me that we would probably have a middle or a high school with that same, uh, same problem. That just doesn't bear out. We do see many instances where we do have, a, say, an introduction in the elementary school and one in the middle school, but we can almost always tie it back to some kind of connection that they're brothers and sisters or they're living together or, or that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, just the, the actual um, uh, thinking that they're being transmitted hitching rides from, from student to student on the school bus, our data is just not bearing that out at this point. Uh, the next consideration, and we probably talked most about this than anything else because it was suggested and recommended uh, several times throughout the past few months uh, from other folks, but nowhere that we looked did anyone ever come close to saying that you should exclude students from school. In fact, they were adamant, and when I say they, I'm talking about the bed bug experts uh, and the other districts uh, that we looked at. Uh, they use words like uh, dignity, respect, discretion, empathy, warned us against stigmatizing the students from this. Uh, so the, the, instead of excluding the students, and the reality of that, if we excluded a student who had a bed bug infestation in their home, how long are we gonna keep them out of school? And if, so if the home's not being treated, so the, the um, the opposite of that is, is the standard operating procedure and certainly we're, you know, all does mean all and we want to have our students in school with us as, as much as possible. So again, there I was- I think the hardest thing too is how do you prove that that one student yeah, right. is infested? I mean, you don't know that where that bed bug came from. So you're gonna stigmatize a child that may is, you know, I, that's the part that I struggle with. That's right, well. I think in an email, Mr. Caldwell, you had said in all instances except one you were able to pinpoint the student? Uh, at, at one point I said that, that's right. Yeah. Okay. 
I think of the of the instances that we had this school year. Right. Yeah. Is there a is there a follow up to that or? I didn't no, know. I was just saying that you can actually yeah. pinpoint the student. Just just about yeah, I every that's time. What I and, we, and we do have situations where uh, it's on a on a carpet in a classroom, and we don't know what you know which student it came from, or it may be in the hallway or some other a common area. But uh, um, to yeah. pinpoint the student to not allow them to come to school. No, I think Cindy was saying that we can't, we don't know where the bed bugs are coming from. But I remember reading an email from Mr. Caldwell where he says, in all instances except one, they were able to figure out which child the bed bugs came in on. But I, I mean, I think that, and I really appreciate Ms. Woods and Mr. Caldwell, um, the sensitivity that is in a part of this policy and the fact that you're using this as an opportunity to mentor families and help them. Um, overcome this problem because I mean you never I mean an eight-year-old wouldn't know why they couldn't come to school because they, they just wouldn't understand that and bed bugs are not a behavior issue um, and so I think what the way the policy and the way your procedures that you have in place are appropriate um, and really I think it fits in the mission to um, put student success and well-being um, first, well, and so I appreciate that. Well, thank you for that. And there, there is a social stigma attached to this, uh, unfortunately. But, but it, it has nothing to do with cleanliness. It has nothing to do with, with wealth or poverty. Uh, I will say that in some areas, some parents may be better able to treat themselves, and in other situations, maybe they're not. Well, that's where we step in, and that's why I want to get the social worker involved on the front end instead of the back end of that. So. Um, Mr. Caldwell, could I just yeah, make a point? Even though we can say that we are able to pinpoint who a or someone that a bed bug came off of, that still does not indicate that they have an infestation in their home. It may have been picked up from someone else. That is always the, the possibility when we see it on someone, which is why we inspect the rest of their belongings, we inspect their clothing, we call the family. And, and we have several times seen a bed bug on a student and the family had the pest control company come out and they did not find anything in that home. So just because we say that we can, you know, it was found on a student, that still doesn't necessarily mean that that particular student is where, you know, their home is where the infestation lies. Correct. I was just correcting that we were unable to determine what student the bed bug came from because I know I had read, and if I had known we were discussing this, I would have, you know, printed the emails and brought the notes and whatever. Um, but I knew at one point in time, Mr. Caldwell had told us that we could pinpoint the student. I can tell you in uh, multiple years of pediatric practice that nothing strikes fear in the heart of a mama than the use of the word bed bug, lice, or scabies. Mm -hmm. It creates such a visceral response. Um, and what I can tell you is that neither three of those organisms care about your retirement plan. They don't mm -hmm. care about your socioeconomic status. They don't care what type of threshold you have at your door. They will cross it, mm -hmm. period. Um, and so I, I think there's always a very important phrase to remember, a bed bug does not an epidemic make. Um, a, a lice does not an epidemic make. A scabies does not an epidemic make. Um, so it, it can be really hard to kind of tamp down some of those emotional feelings that you get when you, because there are people in here scratching their head right now. I, because I use the word lice, there are people who ha are having that emotional hives-like response, and you, if you really want to reach out there and scratch your head right now. Um, and it is really tough, and, and I, I think of all of my reading, everything from the EPA to the CDC to um, uh, any of your, your schools, you know, um, the, the interruption of education is a last resort. Um, and, and I think that's clearly identified in, in just about all of the authorities, if you will. And, and I think it makes sense mm -hmm. because it, it, it is not an epidemic when you have one. You know, it, it's called an epidemic for a reason. We just can't have that emotional response to say, oh my gosh, everybody has scabies now, mm. or everybody has bed bugs. It's not the case. So. Well, the, I'm going to jump on Dr. Guyton here and Ms. Woods. They're not life threatening, correct? Yes, correct. So you can certainly have some very rare types of, of transmittals. Um, in my years of practice, I have never seen one. Um, if anything, I have seen a, you know, a rash 
um, or I have seen, you know, more or less I I of anything a nuisance, if you will. Um, I remember we had sand delivered to our house one time, the sand in the yard, and we ended up getting fleas in the house. Holy cow. I mean, that was, that was a visceral response for me. I was ready to burn down the house. Um, and so it, uh, it, it is more of a nuisance. It's less of a, a truly significant medical concern, but, but um, it does need to be addressed. You know, by, by no means do we want to underscore anything. It does need to be addressed. Um, but as far as extensiveness of disease, no, we typically don't see it. I think you can attest to that, Mamie. I mean, I, I well, and to that, that point, DHEC, uh, the agency, and I'm reading this from their website, responsible for, quote, promoting and protecting the health of the public in South Carolina, no longer addresses bed bugs at all. Um, I, I was uh, made an inadvertent comment earlier in the year thinking that they still did, but they, they don't address it at all, yes or no. That's, that's not, we actually, Dr. Little and I met with a representative from DEC, and that is just not something that they, that they are undertaking at this point, I think because of the nuisance factor versus the, the health uh, aspect of it. Uh, so for board policy considerations, because one of the questions that arose during this research is do we need a board policy? We currently have procedures. We are recommending no board policy uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, there is no legal requirement or, or regulation uh, such as an exclusion from DHEC uh, to do that. And lots of times board policies are written because they're state regulations or state laws. But I don't really want to hide behind that point as much as I do our procedures that we have and, and that we are going to edit, uh, that, and for example, we've edited them in 2014 and in 2017 and again now in 2019, gives us flexibility much easier than it would with a board policy. If we had our procedures uh, written into a policy and a, a, a best practice changed or there, were, there was some other type of treatment or, or anything changed, it would be a two-month process before we could make that change because of the way that we're mandated to change board policy. Um, we think we have very clearly articulated um, procedures that have been borrowed by many of our neighboring districts already. Uh, we can change them at, at a moment's notice. So if something changed tomorrow, we can change our procedures tomorrow versus having to wait a couple of months to do that. So we're not recommending a board policy for that very reason. Uh, our procedures we think are very thorough and complete and, and open to that flexibility that the board policy would not allow us to have. Uh, that is our presentation and I will answer any questions you may have. I think, and you said, and I you probably said this, you met with a, a parent advisory group from parents from all over the district about this and talked about it? Was it a group of like PTO presidents or or teachers? I don't know. I thought you met with somebody. Well, that was for the uh, for the was that for, for the vaping. But, but we had a that presentation. We had, in fact, we met with the parent advisory two months in a row. Okay. Uh, last a few weeks ago and the month prior to uh, to discuss uh, discuss this. Okay. Thank you. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, I think you or Ms. Wood said if they couldn't afford the treatment, they would be referred to a social worker. Um, how do they, does the social, who pays for that, I guess is the question. If they can't afford it and then they get referred out? Well, we, we do have some resources that are being made available to us that, that we can use in, in, in situations where the parents absolutely can't, can't afford that. Okay. And, okay, let's see here. Um, Okay, it says, we will let teachers know that we are providing resealable bags, only take out what you need. Then the letter goes home to the parents. Now, but the things come out of the bags at the end of the day. And so when the kids get on the school bus, and I know you said that they're not hitching rides, your data's not bearing this out. Mm -hmm. How did you gather data about school, if there's bed bugs on the school bus? When I looked for trend data, did I have an elementary kid on a particular bus that had an uh, an introduction and was a, a subsequent middle or high school and it's just not when that did happen it was almost well I say almost always I think it was always I could tie it to it was the same family or there were two families that were living together it wasn't I had no reason to believe that a a bed bug from the a bus got on another student and, and went to their school so what's the reporting procedure for school bus drivers the reporting procedure. Yeah, because I mean, I've gotten calls from bus drivers saying, "Oh my God, there's 
you know, bed bugs on the bus. What do we do? Or how do I get rid of these things? Yeah. Um, but never have they said like, I mean, they called me <laughs> and I told them, you know, go get to some diatomaceous earth and fill every nook and cranny you can. So they would they would need to to contact one of the nurses at one of the schools that they go to because the nurse would need to identify it. Hmm. Okay, so yeah, I don't think they know that. Yeah, we'll we'll be sure that they, they do. do. Okay. Okay. Now, and these procedures you have outlined, where can those be found? Um, they actually are on the um, Google Drive that the nurses use, so all of the nurses have access to them because it starts with the nurse, and so that's why the nurses are the ones that have access to all of the procedures. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. All right, so um, as is often the case, we will um, have Mr. Salters uh, give us an a operations update later in the evening. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of exciting things happening, and uh, we're going to see some, uh, I think, some neat pictures today. Hopefully. Start a little while they're getting that up. Uh, let's thank Ms. Woods and Mr. Caldwell, because that's a lot. A lot of work. And, and the other nurses. You make sure we <clears throat> said thank you. All right. Um, well, Thank you, board. Um, tonight, I'm going to send you or show you some pictures of the construction we've got going on. Centerville Elementary School will start there. Um, recall this school will open in um, this coming August, and so um, really pleased to see some some more walls coming up here. We've got um, um, cafeteria area here, um, classroom wing here. We've got uh, steel and and decking on. They're uh, prepping that for roofing material now, um, and so we're kind of. You can see the staging going around the building. Um, we're, you know, we started here, over here, and then um, here. And this this uh, slab will be poured hopefully later this week, uh, weather uh, permitting. And the good news is, is obviously with this site we can uh, make good progress uh, even a day or so after rain at, with nice sandy soil. So, um, and just recall to orient you, this is Highway One right out here, and this is Rice Drive um, right here. Uh, a, dirt road off of off of um, Highway 1. So the front of the school will be facing Highway 1. You actually see kind of an entrance driveway taking shape right there um, as you come around. Um, this is a shot from the uh, back of the school looking out at, at Highway 1. Um, this is, a, again, a prototype plan of um, the first uh, time it was built was at Rocky Creek and then several other times that we've, we've gone through this plan. So. Um, Looking forward to seeing some more progress here and getting that school open on time. Um, moving on to Pelion, uh, and as you look at these pictures, I just you know flash back. Uh, these this school actually started a little before um, Pelion Middle School, um, and <clears throat> Pelion Middle School. I think they've actually been working now uh, 95 days, and I think they may have had like two rain days um, at that site. Um, this is an overall photo. Again, this is a, a prototype of Beechwood Middle School. Um, and as you recall, you, the classroom wings are here on the left and cafeteria, uh, kitchen area, and then your, your main office administration area, learning commons. Um, and then in, in this uh, plan, the auditorium is here and the, around the band orchestra rooms. And then the gymnasium is here on the front. So those two are flipped at Beechwood, it's, it's the other way. Um, and again, you can see significant progress here. Um, the uh, first classroom wing, the roof deck is on. Uh, second classroom wing, they'll, uh, they'll be setting steel this week. Uh, steel is being set on the um, cafeteria in the back. And the third classroom wing will be um, up to steel bearing height you know, within a week or so. So really making significant progress um, on, on this site. Um, and we're, we're very pleased with that. And, and then <clears throat> they'll be pouring the, uh, the footing, I mean, excuse me, the uh, slabs over here um, and clearing out. Actually, the, this uh, theater area is already being um, excavated so that you create the slope down to the stage area. Uh, that was being done last week. So um, 
real excited about that progress. Yes, sir. So um, I was at a function this weekend. One of the teachers at Beachwood stopped and complimented me, and of course I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> yeah, but I want to thank you and the board members that were on the architectural view. But he talked about how the layout and how the, the, the students are funneled just leads to less disruption, less uh, fights, less conflict. Essentially, they can focus on instruction. And he said, you know, I never thought about architecture allowing instruction, but I see it in play at Beachwood. So. Yeah. Anyhow, great feedback. So thank you all board members that were involved with that. Yeah. And thank you, Jeff. Thanks for sharing that. That's great feedback. Um, moving on to uh, one of our um, newer projects, excited to show you some um, things going on in Pillion at Pillion High School. Um, as you recall, one of the things we're doing there is uh, Pillion High School is uh, without an eight lane track. And so we are um, expanding that. Uh, they actually uh, really couldn't host uh, a lot of ac activities like track meets and so forth that they wanted to. Uh, of course, we just recognize Mr. Beatonbow as uh, Hall of Fame uh, track coach, and he's been doing it on, on a six-lane track for uh, many, many years. So we're excited about that. And also, um, we had a little conversation before. This was the track building, uh, concession building, um, that was uh, very outdated had a number of problems with the restrooms. Uh, there really wasn't adequate changing facilities uh, for the student athletes. So we're excited about uh, bringing new um, facilities there. I thought he, he was about in tears. He was so excited about seeing this building go down So, um, and the new building coming up. So looking forward to that. Um, again, just some more, more progress there. Um, and if you're familiar with this, this layout, of course, Pillion Middle School and the Performing Arts Center is right here. There'll be a new entry created, a new uh, locker room space for male and female athletes, concession area, st and some storage here, and then a, a nice entry plaza um, that will mirror what we have over at softball and, and the baseball facility uh, that was done uh, previously. Um, again, just a, that kind of gives you a better orientation. That's the Performing Arts Center there in the background at the, the back side of Pelion Middle School. We've also been doing a lot of work with our future ready classrooms. Um, our, our procurement office has been very busy um, helping uh, move on some of our older furniture and along with Matt Warren. Um, and you can see uh, the fruits of that labor. This is the new uh, furniture and new, new design of our classrooms in several of our schools. And uh, just to highlight again, Saxcatha, White Knoll Elementary, Elementary and Pillion Elementary. Um, Really appreciate those principals and teachers' um, support as we work through this process and doing this during the, um, you know, during the middle of the school year. We uh, basically, furniture folks get there at six o'clock in the morning and they take cl classrooms down and and put classrooms up and you know and do it at the end of the day as well. So it's uh, it, it's pretty exciting for them and and the students to to see this transformation. Um, and you can see <clears throat> see a lot of the different con uh, configurations. Um, that, that you will see across all of the schools as we continue to roll out um, the, this model uh, of, of new furniture. So very excited about that happening. Um, one of the collaboration stations, as you recall, those are going in each um, of our classrooms um, and students can get together with their devices and uh, sit around and connect to that, that TV and, and work on projects together and, and collaborate. So. Um, and then I just want to take a, to a minute, you know, we're about a year into our uh, facilities program. So I want to give you kind of a high level update. You're not going to be able to read this, um, but th this is a, a, a program schedule of all of our projects um, scheduled out by, by school. Um, and, and what you see is a, a basically a, a design phase in green uh, a contract negotiation phase in yellow, and then a construction phase in, in purple or blue, whatever you want to call that. And you see the red line there. Um, you know, we're about a quarter of the way through, um, or, or, you know, maybe 20% of the way through our, our program. Um, and so I, I just want to highlight to you that um, we, are, we are on schedule with our projects. Um, and, and this, this schedule that was laid out was really um, a guideline. Uh, it, was, it was a way to um, stage our projects based on needs, um, but, but yet also um, work with the cash flow of, of referendum um, set bond sales and so forth. So um, you, you may see some timeframes, you know, move here and there. 
Um, and those uh, occur because of program uh, changes or um, it, it may be, as an example, um, elementary school number 18. Um, obviously, we're still looking for land for that, that site. Um, and so that, you know, that is going to slip uh, a little bit in the schedule. Uh, but again, these are just kind of guidelines as we laid out the overall program. So it was really a draft of what we were looking at. Um, Ms. Green? Um, yeah, Mr. Salters, I was going to ask you, um, so I, there was an article in the paper this past weekend, last week, um, about um, one of our neighboring districts, Richland 2, mm -hmm. um, and they passed a pretty sizable bond at the same time we did. Um, and the article was talking about how pretty much none of their bond dollars have been spent yet. Um, and I was reading the article and I was just kind of astounded because, I mean, as your slides just show, um, we have two schools completely out of the ground um, at the same time frame. Um, do what do you attribute our um, uh, faster progress? Um, well, I appreciate that softball uh, question. Uh, I think you know, I, I would attribute that to uh, great leadership of the board um, and your vision um, to. Uh, <laughs> Well, it's true because you, you, you put together a really um, a good process uh, for selecting the right uh, contractors, the right architectural firms. Um, you also um, did, did a uh, prototype model um, with your um, the new facilities, uh, new school facilities. It, you would not see those, you wouldn't see dirt being turned on those two schools um, yet if we had to design them starting when the referendum passed. Uh, and, and you can see, uh, realistically, um, we're going to be in those schools, um, you know, within a year, year and a half. So um, really that the way that the, the, the program has been structured has allowed a lot of this work to get, get done um, uh, on a really good schedule. Um, what that also has done, as you recall, in our bond sale recently, you know, we got a $15 million premium on that bond sale. And that was because we were able to pull some of the project uh, funding forward so that we could, uh, because the projects are, are getting ready um, and the original outlay was, you know, kind of stretched out a little bit further. And by pulling those forward, we, we did a bigger bond sale at one time. And that's a $15 million um, uh, amount of money that was not programmed anywhere. It wasn't counted for. So that's a really big, big benefit. But um, I'll just show you, uh, of course, this is the rest of the projects, if you will, um, as we go through. But I, I have here um, just an update um, of where we are to date. And so we have, um, you know, 32 million, $32.5 million in project expenditures uh, to date. And then we've encumbered another $84.7 uh, million. So for a total of about 116 117 million dollars um, that we've, uh, you know, ex encumbered or, or spent to date. So uh, we're well on our way uh, to to getting this um, this work out to our schools. Uh, one of the things that, that that I believe is really important with that is uh, the need. You know, it's been 10 years since we did a referendum, um, and so the needs were great um, before we did the referendum, and the longer we wait. Um, the longer our students and staff have to wait and our community has to wait for the benefits of these uh, improvements. Um, but also, with every year you wait, um, costs go up. And so um, the sooner you can get projects done, typically, historically, the cheaper those projects come in. And so um, it, it's, a, it's a real benefit to be ready from the ground up. Well, and I can actually um, throw a little congratulations your way, um, or uh, I was able to, to pra praise your department. Um, so several weeks ago, I was at an event and I was talking to a board member from Lexington Five, um, and he was kind of lamenting their construction project that they have right now, the um, Amex Ferry Elementary School that mm -hmm. had been in the news, um, and their process on that started prior to our bond referendum, and they don't even have a shovel of dirt turned yet. Um, and he was asking how we were able to be so far ahead on our projects and get them going. So, I mean, they're still, I think, in the design phase, maybe, on theirs. And um, and I said, well, actually, it's a credit to our operations staff and the expertise that we have and the um, relationships that we have with contractors and the experience we have. So I think, I mean, you, 
you credit the board with the leadership, and we appreciate that. But I think a lot of the credit goes to your department and just um, the way that you have managed this thus far and for many, many years. So. Well, I, I do appreciate that. We we are very fortunate to have a lot of experience doing this kind of work. So it does, and that does help. Um, if you built one school every ten or fifteen years, it would it would be a little more challenging for sure. So thank you for that. Um, and just, uh, you know, as a reminder, as I wrap up uh, the building plan progress, all of our projects are tracked on our on our website, thanks to our support from our communications team. Um, and, and so you can go to that link and, and we have photos that we keep current um, on, on that site uh, for uh, for your use. So um, be happy to answer any other questions you have. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Stacy is going to talk about animals in schools for just a, I think, just a brief moment. Just a brief moment. Um, just to let you know, this past spring and even in early into the fall, we've had several um, situations that have involved animals in schools, and like maybe we didn't even know they were there. And so we realized as a district that we really need to have a policy related to animals on school grounds. Um, when I looked at our board policies, there was only one policy that mentioned animals, and that was you couldn't take an animal on a school bus. And so we formed a committee of the following employees, um, Holly Sullivan, who's our coordinator for science, um, Tracy Pender, who's our director for school counseling, Anna O'Kane, the coordinator for section 504, Wendy Balo, the director of special ed, Meredith Siebert, who works in human resources, and Devonna Price, the Director of Human Resources. And the purpose of the committee was really to just determine the basic structure for animals on school property. We started looking at the school board model policy, and the school board model policy was an I policy, which is instruction, but it really addressed only service animals and primarily their use in an instructional setting. And we felt that we really need to separate out the different conditions in which we would allow animals on school grounds. So next month, I'm going to bring to you a proposed policy for the use of animals in schools for instructional purposes. And it will include a draft of internal procedures outlining the approval process. Um, those procedures would include steps such as identifying curriculum standards, um, caretaking plans, advanced notification to parents and students for health-related um, reasons and safety procedures. And then in addition, what we plan to do is then look at the need for policies to address service and emotional support animals in the school setting. And so in January, we plan to present to you three other policies. One, student use of animals in schools, which would be a J policy, employee use of animals in schools, which would be a G policy, and then visitor use of animals in schools, which would be a K policy. Um, and one reason, I mean, to think about it, there is an instructional need, but then we also have to look at the, um, the service animal and emotional support need. And so a live animal would be approved because it's a standards-based curriculum, and it would, could be twofold. It could be short-term. We have these organizations that bring animals into the school, like you can read to a dog. Um, or um, I think Healing Species comes in and helps kids get through some emotional trauma. So that would be a short-term use. The long-term would be an animal that stays in there for, say, the duration of a unit. Um, we have, we've hatched eggs and baby chickens and that kind of stuff. The husbandry program at LTC. And so, and so that would be one part. And then the service and emotional support, we just need to make sure that we follow all the applicable um, federal laws. Title II, which is public accessibility, and then Section 504 and ADA. So that's just something for you to look forward to. If you have questions or things that you know need to be included in that policy, if you let me know, we'll make sure that when we bring that first reading to you in December, we got it covered. Well, thank you. We went on a school tour last month, and we had a teacher ask us about this, and I appreciate y'all being so responsive to her request. So thank right. you. Thank you. Interestingly, we, we have seen a... a significant rise in our request in our office for um, medical necessity of emotional support animals and those kind of things. So it's definitely a, a, a groundswell that we're seeing. Um, you know, uh, the ADA standards are pretty, pretty cut and dry on the differentiation between emotional support and a, a service animal and, and the, the various roles. And so 
<clears throat> we're, we're honestly still trying to figure it out ourselves as to um, what that process looks like. So it's uh, it's definitely we're seeing more of this. So. All right, thank you. We have a guinea pig. I'd be happy to loan to a classroom. <laughs> <laughs> I got a beagle, but <laughs> and it and it has fleas. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much about animals in classroom. I look forward to another spirited conversation about that. Um, you want me to just move on? I mean, I know it's no longer my report, but it's kind of the same thing. So um, I, Mr. Caldwell was working overtime this month, and he's going to talk a little bit about, uh, or last couple months, about the reading of our, of our tobacco policy. And I just want to say, uh, just in terms of context, if you'll recall, we had to get a policy out uh, because of some legal things, and I so much appreciate how Mr. Caldwell has approached this uh, as we've looked at the policy moving forward, uh, speaking to students, parents, and our teacher groups um, about uh, the, to the tobacco policy, and I believe we have some recommendations to make changes to the changes that we made back in uh, August or July, I guess July, it was, actually, it was in right. July. So. Um, uh, I just want to say publicly, thank you very much. That this took a lot of energy and effort to uh, come up with this first draft. I'd also like to thank Dr. Guyton for his feedback. We had a, a great meeting with him when he had some um, very specific things he wanted to make sure uh, showed up in the policy. So thank you, Dr. Guyton, for your feedback. And uh, Mr. Caldwell. Thank you, Dr. Little, Madam Chair, and members of the board. Uh, you may recall that while there are three policies, the language is identical, so in deference of, of time, I would prefer to talk about all these collectively because otherwise I'm going to say the same thing three times. Um, and to Dr. Little's point, we did we did push this thing through and then got the feedback after the fact, and we found the feedback to be uh, uh, most helpful. And I just want to point out uh, kind of some of the significant changes that we made. Uh, they are particular to uh, the student uh, discipline part uh, of the of the policies. Uh, you will notice in your in your policies that we've redlined all of the current uh, consequences. Now, some of those got added back, but uh, to make it easier to read, um, we are recommending that the uh, for the first offense, the item will be confiscated and not returned. Uh, there will be an administrator conference with parent and or guardian and a referral to law enforcement. And along with that, a one-day in-school suspension. That is a change from the out-of-school suspension that we had prior. And during that in-school suspension day, the students will be required to complete an online tobacco vaping cessation program. We're currently looking at some of those programs now. Uh, there will be very little, if any, cost involved. We are hoping for that. Uh, the second offense, uh, we cur it currently is a th uh, up to three-day out-of-school suspension. Uh, we are, have changed that. And it's going back to the, the item will be confiscated and not returned. Conference with the parent a referral to law enforcement, and uh, the probably the one of the biggest significant changes is a student will be required to complete six hours of community service. That was a, a big push from a lot of the folks we talked to, and we're going to have that community service at the school, so it can be monitored. It can be it can be you know uh, uh, supervised there, uh, and also the student will be assigned to a Laredac level tobacco vaping cessation program. So that kind of ramps it up uh, a little bit more. For the third offense, uh, we went, uh, what's going to sound harsh, but let me talk through this. Again, we're going to confiscate the items. We're not going to return them, law enforcement, the conference. But then uh, if it's a third offense, then we are going to suspend out of school and recommend expulsion. Now, before that sounds too harsh, um, I want to say that we, we have adopted a very therapeutic approach to our discipline implementation over the last few years. And even though a recommendation for expulsion is uh, the harshest penalty that we have, our hope would be, uh, and our numbers bear out, that uh, very few students, in fact, the data from last year indicate that eight students uh, had a third offense. And we're not talking about a huge number of students. That's yes, ma'am. That's district wide. Um, but even if they're recommended for expulsion, we are hoping for some Project Hope type uh, intervention with that student. The student may may uh, report to our uh, AES where there's some very significant, um, you know, uh, interventions in place. If a student has a third offense of this, the student may just be non-compliant. 
but in all likelihood the student has an addiction problem. And so we, maybe we can isolate that student and get some, uh, some very intense uh, therapy for the student. We may be able to, to help him or her with that, with that addiction, should that be the case. Uh, the other things that I changed in the policy uh, had to do with the education and assistance. Um, I, I, pardon me, the, uh, the receiving money from the tobacco industry. I just firmed that up to be sure that we, we cover tobacco, vaping, electronic cigarettes, so no one could say we didn't cover all of the bases there. So that's really some clerical um, uh, changes there. But I just wanted to highlight the, 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 our big changes to how we're going to treat these from a student discipline standpoint. So we do bring those forth to you for first reading and review, and I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have. Mr. Caldwell, um, and this isn't one of the changes that you've made, um, but this is a question that's come up a couple times since this policy was approved in July. Um, with the staff discipline on this, there's five bullet points. Um, are those progressive? Is it a step-by-step? -step? Is it you get all five? Is the whole book thrown at you? Um, is it up to the administrator at the school how that's enforced? Um, I, uh, there's not a whole lot of clarity on how the staff um, discipline on these infractions would go. That's just I would say it would follow. We have a, the code of conduct, mm -hmm. so it would be addressed there for not following rules. I mean, there, we'd upslope them. That's, that's the new verb in the district is we upslope someone, which is the company that we use their procedures. But we would just follow that. So is the code of conduct consistent with these? Um, bullets on here? Well, I don't know that we have a code of conduct that would speak specifically that say vaping, but it would be something that we don't permit staff to do on school grounds, so we would not follow school grounds policy or whatever in terms of the code. And I would say to that point, during this next month, I'll certainly, uh, HR and our department will, will get together to be, sh we'll, we'll compare what what do we have, and if there needs to be edits to that for a second reading, we can certainly add that. I mean, sure, I just think sure there's a lot of discretion for an administrator here. You know, they're going to uh, suspend the staff member, but somebody else might just give them a reprimand. Uh, so I think there needs to be some consistency in how the, the you progress through that discipline. And also for contract and other workers and visitors and volunteers, the same thing. I had that in my notes too, a tiered system of consequences similar to what the students have, so you know what happens on the first, second, third offense. I'm sorry, Mary Beth was in my ear. <laughs> <laughs> I do apologize for that, would you mind? That's okay, I was just saying, I would like to see, I had that in my notes, a tiered system of consequences, first, second, third offense, broken down, I mean, same thing Anne Marie was saying. For, you, you, for, for adults, for employees? For staff, okay. contract, visitors, mm -hmm. volunteers, yes, everyone. Yeah. I would say, I think students are different than those other three groups. So students, we have an education correction obligation to. Those other three groups, I mean, they are here at the will of, of as an employer or as a host. So again, they are adults. And so I think, um, you know, we need to give our administrative leaders the leeway to deal with adults appropriately, so. Very good. I think this, um, you know, this is an acknowledgement of both the, the, the duality of vaping, if you will, in the sense that, um, you, you know, the kids are being victimized at the end of the day, um, but also um, it's against the law. And so it's a tension that exists there and you, you can't forsake one and not pay attention to the other. And so um, I think this provides both an educational opportunity for the student but it also provides that, um, that corrective measure, if you will. So it seems to be a very, a very balanced approach. Um, one thing I would caution against is um, the board commits to the following, maintaining a 100% tobacco and nicotine free. <laughs> Again, I think that's a tough one right there, the nicotine free. There almost needs to be some sort of qualifier in there unless a part of a smoking cessation program or something along those lines because um, I think otherwise it's going to become a, um, um, it can become quite a headache to try to track um, if it's supposed to be 100% nicotine free. Well, now you have to have this letter and that letter and so on and so forth. And so I think if we go ahead and lay out that um, nicotine free, yes, in the terms of consumption of nicotine outside the scope of 
a smoking cessation program, directed smoking cessation program. You just can't go buy some Nicorette gum and say, I'm on a smoking cessation program. Um, so that would be the only um, caveat I would put there. I think um, as a board, um, I think we, the uh, AHA American Heart Association is having a very uh, dynamic approach to vaping right now. They're spending millions upon millions of dollars. Um, and one of the things is involvement of the legislatures and the policymakers. And so I think as a board, um, maybe the potential of us unifying with some of the other districts and, and such to um, basically develop a, uh, a resolution to our policymakers that we need some tighter laws governing vaping tobacco use in, in children because you know it's the same playbook from big tobacco um, we just need to have a response and so I would I would say to challenge us I'm not making a motion right now but I would say to challenge us all that maybe over the course of this that this leads to a resolution coming from from this board and maybe from this Lexington and we County probably body. leverage our arrangement with SCSBA and that's, that's the South Carolina School Boards Association and I, I would love to challenge all the school boards in the whole state to challenge the legislate, le, legislators and come up with something to combat this problem. Well, and this is um, timely because we have our um, SESBA Legislative Advocacy, and Advocacy Conference uh, first weekend in December, and that's where the School Board Association for the state, all the school board members in the state vote to set our legislative priorities for the year, what we want the association to lobby for on our behalf and what we agree to lobby for. And I think that maybe this might be something we suggest from the floor mm. as an addition to our priorities, uh, because I think that there'll be a lot of widespread support for that. And I know, I think Dr. Little's had a conversation with Chris Wooten. I've had a conversation with Paula Calhoun. Uh, we're trying real hard to plant seeds and let them know, you know, that it's an epidemic and we need all the help we can get. That, that goes back, I, I did have a question. Since there's been so much negative about these people dying and having their lungs, lung transplants and these kids going into these comas all over the nation, have we seen a drop at all? I mean, are, have the principals reported any drops in vape usage or is it still just as prevalent? I, I have not, they, they have not reported that there's been a drop, so I think the prevalence is still there. I, I don't have the numbers for this school year, uh, but I don't, uh, I don't have I mean, any. I'm just hoping that I mean, the news is terrible coming out on it. So, okay. Any other questions, board? I have a couple. Okay. I would really like to see that from the volunteers, the termination from volunteer positions. I just don't like that they can be removed. Well, first of all, we don't know if it's first, second, or third offense. Um, but that's another reason I'd like to see a tiered system because I'd hate to see schools lose volunteers because they're at their kids, you know, football game and they're called vaping or something okay. I mean that's just how I feel right. um, also let's see here uh, from the previous policy there was suspension from extra extracurricular activities but it's not in here and I know you had told us before that that could be found in the athletic handbook but extracurricular activities include more than just athletics. Yes, ma'am, and that was an oversight. That should have been added. Okay. As okay. A, that, was, that was a mistake on my part. I didn't put that back in. Okay, um, and another note I have here. Um, in the other policy, it said community service and or loss of driving privileges. I think this is a big deterrent for high schoolers, and it's not like we're taking anything away from them. They're just gonna have to ride the school bus. So they're not losing, you know, any instructional time, they just don't get to drive to school. I think that was in the in the model policy that you're referring to. Well, it was in one of those policies that yeah, we went I over. I think in it was it was from the model June. of the state. Okay. Mm -hmm. July, yeah. And board, this is first reading, and so if you have suggestions or ideas, just um, reach out to Mr. Caldwell, and he'll incorporate those before next our next meeting. I have Any? a couple more questions. Oh, yeah. sorry. Um, okay. How do we plan to educate the staff? I know that was a discussion last time, and I know, you know, I've got a, one in high school, one in middle school, and they say that, you know, some of the teachers don't even realize what's going on. Well, and I've researched that. In fact, I came across uh, a video, and I'm not trying to uh, get ahead of myself with this, um, because that is a, a question that comes up a lot as far as uh, the ability to vape in class and how the students are kind of making a, a game out of it. 
Uh, so I've actually researched that, and I found an educational video that was done by, I think, a school principal somewhere in the nation uh, that was sponsored by the school board association or someone. I don't remember how it came to me. Uh, so we're, we're looking at those type things that we could push out to the schools. It, it's not, you know, hours and hours of training, but it's, it's you know, very uh, concise uh, techniques to, to help the teachers recognize what they look for and, and the signs and things and that sort of so we would hope to be able to push that out to our teachers to, to give them a um, at least try to level the playing field with the with the students right i mean i don't want y'all going through tons of training no, 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 i'm just saying when we went to the thing at sure. white knoll i had never you know seen a vape or jewel but they had all of that laid out yes. you know one of, even one of the games that the kids them. try to play i'm not saying they do it in lexington one they probably do is uh, you know the the jewels that look like uh, flash drives. Flash drives. Right. So they play this game to say who's the first one that can be successful in convincing the teacher to charge it for them, under the guise that it's a that it's a flash drive. So that it kind of becomes a game, and and they're always two or three steps ahead of us anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to kind of push that information out so the teachers at least be be cognizant of what they're doing. Well, I don't, I don't want to interrupt if you have something else, Jada, but I was going to mention, because I think last time when we talked about this in July, uh, we talked about being more proactive in our education. Um, and I would like to see um, maybe using our um, district Twitter account or Facebook account with just a, did you know one vaping cartridge equals two packs of cigarettes? It has the nicotine. of Just a quick fact that I think would reach our <coughs> staff and our parents. Um, I think some, you know, being a little bit more um, or a lot more proactive. I think having a policy is great, um, but nobody's just going to go voluntarily look at policies in case there's something that applies to them. Um, but they might read a one or two sentence Twitter blast or, you know, maybe a Facebook post that has links to an article that was, you know, about something that was covered at the White Knoll event. I mean, I think that we just needed. This is something. That, our job is to educate students, and I think the more we push this information out so that the parents see it and the teachers see it, uh, the better off we'll be in winning this fight. So that's just my thoughts. Good thoughts. Thank you. Board, any other comments or questions? Well, I, I'd like to just take a moment and uh, thank uh, Dr. Guyton and Dr. Little. Laredak uh, did a panel uh, at White Knoll High School a couple weeks ago, and uh, Lexington 1 and Lexington 2 were supporters of that panel. We had a young man come in who actually went into a, a coma or something where he had some issues and he travels around the nation. But Dr. Guyton was our medical expert and Dr. Little represented the schools and um, it, it was a great night, so informative. And in fact, it was so good, I think Dr. Little is trying to get that young man to come speak at all the right. high schools and maybe even the middle schools. Yeah. But, and I wanna thank you, uh, Dr. Call, I mean, Mr. Caldwell, cause this vaping thing, it, it's, we're trying I want people to understand how serious this board is to this problem and how we're trying to address it, but it's kind of a freight train. And uh, we, I think this is a good start, and I think I'm so glad you're working with the parents and the teachers to, for us to come up with the best policies and guidelines. Thank you. So, thank you, Dr. Guyton. I've thank got you, another Dr. question. Mm -hmm. um, when it says the student will be required to complete community service, um, what will they be doing, when will they be doing it, and who's gonna supervise that? Well, we haven't worked that uh, all those details out yet, okay. uh, but it would we we talked about several options, and the community service on a Saturday or the community service after school is problematic for a lot of reasons. Uh, the supervision part of it, uh, the the transportation part of it, uh, so it may be um, a custodial assistance uh, for two hours after school for three days. It doesn't necessarily have to be six hours. Uh, you know, we, we're not going to take away from from class time, right. uh, but we're we'll, we're still we're still in the uh, infant stages of that particular component. Okay, thank you. Okay. And just so you know that uh, we, uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but uh, it the numbers that we had for first offense dropped to about 11, 10 or eleven percent of students who had two offenses, and then down to about I think it was. 2% of the students that had three. So it, it drops off significantly. Um, so we're, we're, if that trend holds, and we're not talking about a tremendous amount of kids that will be doing the community service or having to be recommended for expulsion. Those numbers may change, but that's, what it, that's how it bared out for 18, 19. And, and kind of on the heels of that, that 2%, that young man who spoke at White Knoll, that's a true addiction. And this, this kid was doing 
the equivalent of four packs of cigarettes a day. He was waking up in the middle of the night to vape, yeah. he said. So do some quick math. A cigarette takes, what, three to five minutes to smoke? Three to five times 80, okay? So you got 80 cigarettes times five minutes. That's uh, 400 a day. Yeah. Um, that's 400 minutes a day. Yeah. Here's the trick to Jewel. <laughs> they can do that in about the quarter of the time. So, so a cartridge, when they, when they do these cartridges, it eliminates that friction of that time commitment to smoke. And so, um, you know, he, he can do the equivalent of four cigarettes in a quarter amount of the time. Um, and so it's, that's just why it's, it's so easy for these kids to get addicted. That's all we have. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Little. Thank you, uh, Mr. Caldwell. I just wanted to kind of give you a little update on what your board's been up to since we saw you last. Um, we've been to several Code to the Future um, exhibitions, and uh, so exciting because we saw some of our schools who were in year two. I think Miss Green was at one of those, and she was talking about just the level since last year, how much these kids have progressed. And then we were, several of us were at uh, Gilbert, um, excuse me, not Gilbert, Pillion Elementary, and they're in the first year, and I mean the electricity and how excited these kids are about coding and what they're learning was just really exciting. And it was really exciting to see their parents there as well because their parents were so proud of them. Um, we are continuing our ongoing relationship with our county council, and the board officers invited their uh, board officers to come tour Beechwood. And the primary reason we did that is because it's a prototype school and that is what we're going to be building for the new Lexington Middle and what we're currently building for Pillion Middle. And those of you who keep up with County Council, the board chair for County Council is a resident of Pillion. And I can only tell you he was so excited walking out of Beechwood. It almost made you cry. He was so excited to be bringing that because he said you're going to bring this school to Pillion, and he was so excited because it's just a, just a great thing, and plus it's just coming up so fast out in Pillion. So that was wonderful. And then also uh, Mr. Hudson, uh, Daryl Hudson, has um, had some issues with some of the things we've done building-wise, and he actually came on a Beechwood tour with the foundation, and um, I think he was very pleased, and he understands that it's a prototype and that we're going to just replicate that success. So we're keeping that relationship going with County Council. Most of your board members attended a tour at White Knoll Middle, and I can tell you we were absolutely blown away. It was n about 99% student-led, and those students, oh my goodness, it was just a great morning, and seeing what all they're doing out there, and um, just a great little school. Several of us uh, attended Veterans Day events. I think all of our schools ho hosted Veterans Day events, and. Um, just a wonderful day and night. And if you ever get a chance, uh, the ROTC instructor at White Knoll High School has actually written a song. They've set it to music, and it is the most beautiful song in memory of our fall fallen heroes. And so he actually, I think, is going to, what do you do with music? Get it copyrighted? And he's going to try to get it copyrighted and get it printed. And it's just that was just a wonderful event. Um, I think Anne Marie and went to some leadership training last week. I was on a panel of um, school board members from the five districts in the Midlands um, talking to Leadership Columbia's 2020 class about school board governance and issues and school funding. And um, it was quite interesting to hear the different school districts and um, how we're all on the same page. And we just talked about um, how important it is for good people to run for school board and um, just to pay attention to what our public school districts are doing. Exactly. And last but not least, several of your school board members have been asked to serve on uh, guidance counselor ad advisory committees. And I know uh, Mr. Oswald and I were on one together, and I know Ms. Green's on one, and I think Mr. Anderson's been asked to participate on two. And uh, that's a little scary, having Mr. Anderson out there like that. But <laughs> and we can talk about him since he's not here. But anyway. Um, it, that that was a, I learned a lot, and it's really interesting what our schools are going through in terms of uh, guidance and counseling and everything, and we appreciate them asking us to serve on those committees. Is there anything else I forgot? Because <laughs> I know we've had a busy couple of weeks. Uh, can I just add, um, the, I went to the Midway Advisory Council, go, mm -hmm. Guidance Advisory Council meeting this morning, um, and they were just walking through um, 
their accomplishments for the year and their goals and things like that. Um, and I was so pleased to hear the emphasis that they have. On, the district has um, anti-bullying curriculum that the um, guidance departments use regularly. I mean, I think a couple times a month, um, but how much a part of everything they do, that the, the kindness, mm -hmm. um, Emphasis is incorporated, and you know, in, uh, starting a kindness week along with Red Ribbon Week, um, and just what a good job um, our our guidance departments are doing in um, helping students understand what bullying is and um, how to um, to not be that person that bullies, but also how to handle it and what you know, just the steps that they're um, encouraging children to take um, to make their schools healthy and kind. Um, and so I really was very impressed with what's going on. And 13.0 are items for board information. This includes the mon monthly general fund financial report for October 2019, the monthly general fund budget transfers for October 2019, the monthly capital projects report for October 2019, and the monthly unauthorized procurements report October 2019. And with that, I just would like to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving, and I would like for you to know that the board really appreciates the staff, the administrators, our teachers, and we have a whole row of teachers right here, how much we appreciate what each and every one of you do for our students every single day. So thank you so much, and happy Thanksgiving, and do I have a motion to adjourn? Do I have a second? Second. Okay, motion, Ms. Green. Second, Mr. Oswald. All in favor, please stand up and thank you. Whew, that was long.